Tongue not to cross. I've got six. Yeah, looks like it's time. Oh, we didn't check this. Welcome, everyone. Is this on? Yeah. You can hear? Everybody here okay? Not very good. No, maybe we can turn that up a bit. <coughs> no, it's Time. six. It's six it o'clock now. What? It's, it's six, six right o'clock now. now. You wanted to give two minutes? Are people still coming in? Uh, we'll find out once we get the cards. Yeah. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming uh, to tonight's meeting for the Soquel Creek Water District. Um, we have um, one item that is the wa the roll call will show all the directors are here. Um, and then our first item, there's no public hearing tonight. The, um, the administrative business, the first thing is to certify the election and take an oath of office for directors Jaffe, Christensen, and Lather. So I'm happy that they're sitting here with me and um, we'll let Bob take over. Sure. You want to stand, the three of you? And repeat after me, except for the names that are yours. I. I. Carla Christensen. Bruce Jaffe. Do you solemnly swear or affirm? Do you solemnly, solemnly swear, swear or, or affirm? affirm? That I will defend the Constitution of the United States that I will that defend, I will the, defend Constitution the Constitution of the United States. States and the Constitution of the State of California and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies against all enemies foreign and domestic foreign and domestic that I will bear true faith and allegiance that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California and the Constitution of the State of California that I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without, without any mental, mental reservation, reservation or purpose of evasion. evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. Discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Upon which I am about, about to enter. enter. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge um, our new board clerk, Emma Olin. It's great to have you on. Mm -hmm. And um, I also wanted to thank the our, our staff that filled in when we needed their help to perform those duties. So both thank you to Tracy and to Ryan. And uh, Ryan and Ron, do you want to have a yeah, word? Uh, yeah. I, just like to say, you know, it was amazing when uh, our previous board clerk uh, fell in love and, and, and left us for a better option, I guess. Um, <laughs> what staff did was amazing. I mean, it, yeah, Tracy and Ryan uh, took the bull by the horns and each took a different task. And then at one point they had to switch. So while Ryan prepared the board packets uh, uh, and, and Tracy did the board clerking. Actually, Ryan had to fill that role and see him working side to side, but it wasn't just them. Every manager stepped into some role. And, and we're so glad to have Emma. She's just right in there with us now in that team spirit. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so the next item on the agenda is item 2.52, the Pure Water SoCal Groundwater Replenishment and Seawater Intrusion Project. Um, and I'm going to read an introduction to that but I also just wanted to make a personal comment that you know we've all um, come here because we care about what happens with the water of our area and I just want to have us just enter it into a, kind of with an attitude of listening to each other and respecting each other and um, you know and that's all I just wanted to make that point that everybody's trying their best um, but the next item um, concerning Pure Water SoCal Groundwater Replenishment and Seawater Intrusion Prevention Project, which purposes to supplement the natural recharge of the Santa Cruz Mid-County Groundwater Basin with purified water 
The proposed project includes producing purified water from existing secondary influent through treatment facilities located in either the city of Santa Cruz and or unincorporated Santa Cruz County. Purified water would be conveyed in recharge wells, conveyed to recharge wells to recharge and replenish the groundwater basin. As most of those here tonight are aware, this proposed project has been the subject of much study over many years and a lengthy environmental and public review process pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act, which we'll call CEQA. Tonight, the board is asked to consider the results of these processes. Specifically, the board has before it staff's recommendations to approve resolution 18-30, which would certify the final environmental impact report for Pure Water SoCal project and to approve resolution 18-31, which would adopt environmental findings with regard to the project EIR, adopt a statement of overriding considerations and a mitigation and monitoring and reporting program regarding the project and approve the project. So for this item, we're first going to hear from District Special Counsel, Michelle Ouellette, um, regarding the proceedings which will govern tonight's meeting on the project. So Ms. Ouellette. Thank you, President LeHue. <clears throat> My name is Michelle Willette. I'm a partner with the law firm of Best Bust and Krieger, and I'm serving as special counsel to the district and the board with regard to the Pure Water Soquel project. I'm also a proud banana slug, a 1980 graduate of UC Santa Cruz, College 8, <laughs> and a past Scotts Valley resident, and I'm happy to be back. As President LeHue indicated, tonight the board will first be considering Resolution 18-30, which if approved would certify the final environmental impact report for the Pure Water SoCal project. And if the board votes to certify the EIR, then to consider Resolution 18-31, which would approve the project, which we'll talk about in more detail later. Tonight, the board will first hear a staff presentation led by Ron Duncan, the district's general manager, a presentation on the EIR and the EIR processes by Elisa Moore from ESA, the EIR consultant for the project, and then a final presentation by District Special Projects Communications Manager, Melanie Schumacher, regarding the resolutions before the board tonight. The board will then have the opportunity to pose any questions to staff and environmental consultants, and of course, lawyers. <laughs> Following this, the public will be given an opportunity to speak. Could we have a show of hands of who would like to address the board tonight? I didn't see how about 15 or so. 15, 15 to 20 people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, three. Mm -hmm. three. Given the number of people that are planning to speak then, and to order to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to be heard, we are limiting public comment to three minutes per person to speak. The board welcomes your comments and feedback and encourages anyone who wishes to speak to offer their comments tonight, even if you didn't raise your hand. We want to hear what you have to say. However, we would like to remind the public that speakers may not reserve time, share time, or give their time to someone else. We also, we would like to remind everyone the public comment period of the meeting is for the public to provide their comments and feedback to the board. As such, the board will not be engaging in dialogue with or answering questions from the audience. Additionally, we encourage everyone to refrain from disrupting other speakers, staff, and members of the board by clapping, cheering, booing. This will give everyone the opportunity to present their comments and ensure a productive and efficient meeting. If you have not already done so, and if you wish to do so, please fill out a speaker card and give it to one of our staff people in the back of the room Yep, pulling up the card. So we know you wish to address the board on this item. After everyone has provided comments, we will take a short break. When we come back, staff will respond to comments as needed. Following completion of public comments and staff responses, the board will then ask any final questions of staff, consultants, and legal counsel 
deliberate, and consider taking action. Finally, to ensure that all the documents are provided to the board, if you have brought written materials or comments tonight, could you please provide it to either someone in the back of the room or Emma so or Bob so that we can make sure it's distributed to the board and can be digested. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. And so now, um, I think Ron, it's, you're up. Okay, great. Thank you, President LeHue. There are a few new faces in the crowd. So I'm Ron Duncan, the general manager for Soquel Creek Water District. I've been with the agency about 15 years, most of it in the capacity of the conservation uh, manager. Uh, I've been in, uh, in water my entire professional career. I went into it uh, to basically clean up aquifers and help uh, promote stream enhancement. Uh, my I've lived here for about 20 years. My boys were born here. They're actually in the crowd tonight, the first meeting they've ever attended. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, my wife uh, teaches in the art at uh, Mountain School. So a little background about me. So next slide. It's been a long and winding road to get to this spot. We've been chasing uh, uh, solutions in this community about 70 years to, uh, for a supplemental supply project or some kind of solution. In the early 50s or mid 50s, uh, that's when the problems were first identified at the city of Santa Cruz that they had a water shortage. In the 60s, the USGS said seawater intrusion is a real threat and we better get ready for it. Then we, we go down the road and actually in the, in the late 60s was kind of the big dam era. We looked at about seven or eight dams. When I say we, I mean collectively. It was before my time at the county. And then desal was actually considered in the, in the 70s, then recycle in the 90s. And ever since that time, we've been basically rehashing um, the same old potential solutions to this point. So let me bring you to modern history. In about 2014, uh, the district uh, sought out a new journey to try to create a, a, a sustainable, reliable water supply. The, we, we knew that public involvement and engagement was key, just absolute key understanding what the public wanted. We'd learned from the past. so. We went on a 14, 15 month journey just to define the values, the values that the community wanted in a water supply. Not so much the water supply, but what's important to them. And then the board said, if we determine that, we can use science to define what, what backs those values, what, what matches those values. And so that's the approach that we basically have uh, taking and up here you'll see on the left this is our community water plan I actually have a copy here they're online and available to, to anybody I encourage you to look at it the community water plan basically composes of two big things one on the, the two items on the left there conservation and well management those are cornerstones uh, that's that's fundamental to what we do and our customers and they've done it well thank you to everybody who has been conserving the four icons on the right are the various supplies we identified early on that might have potential um, to succeed. And so we've been evaluating those throughout the community water plan. I will say that, that's okay, um, that you can say it's a long history, so why is it so important to, to, to move now? There's two big things. One, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. In 2014, the governor said no more overdrafting of basins. This madness has got to end, and they made a law. You've got to create a plan in two years, and you've got to solve the problem by 2040. Otherwise, we're going to come in before then. If your plan doesn't look good or you don't meet your milestones, and we're going to lay the hammer down, and actually somebody did this on the fist on my desk in my office when I asked what happened if we don't meet the plan. They said we're going to come in and cut everybody carte blanche. So that's the regional water board stance. The other big thing was we had a technique that was brought to us by the Danish government that identified seawater intrusion is right at the shoreline where it's not already on shore. We thought maybe we had 
maybe it was a half mile out or a mile out, it is right at the shoreline. And that's been in collaboration with the uh, US Geological Survey to some degree and Stanford University. So what you see on the screen here, just to bring a little perspective or, or appreciation, this is a water drop exposed to positive energy, kind of a, a mandala, if you will. Next slide. These are the six community values that were identified in that journey uh, to find out what's important to our customers. You can see them up there. I won't read them, just take a minute to look at them because I am gonna go through them each individually. <coughs> so the key is we used a science-based, community values-driven process to, drive, to get where we're at. Okay, so I'll jump into each one real quickly. Water quality at the bottom line. If you don't get past this, it's a no-go for whatever project you're considering. You've got to have good water quality. Our board has shown that. They've gone beyond the call of duty with um, cleaning up. We have naturally occurring chrome and arsenic in our aquifers. They've always said, do more than what's necessary. We've been on the leading edge of that. So to make sure that the project, when we started looking at Pure Water Soquel, could provide clean water, they said, we want an independent third-party review. We want, so they went out and commissioned the National Water Research Institute, a panel of the people you see up there. I think the person on the left is from a professor from Berkeley, the next person's from EPA and down the list, representing a range of uh, fields from toxicology to risk assessment to recycled water, hydrology, the whole gamut. And what, I want, what I'll read, and, and they did several community meetings, and these are online. Uh, you can go to our website and you can watch them if you want. Very interesting if you're if you, if you want to see the leading edge science. But this is what they concluded. The project is plausible, feasible, and can produce water that meets all drinking water requirements and is protective of human health and the environment. That was their bottom line. I think that was noted kind of by the Sentinel article with a thumbs up there. You know, recycled water is heavily regulated uh, by EPA and the state regulators. Um, and it's also going on over in 30 places in just the state of California. And this map shows to 30 places. Um, I think what was important to our board was to see what others were doing. So they actually flew to different places, drove to different places to check it out kind of a boots on the ground kind of thing. Besides all the paperwork going on, they went and talked to the operators, the board members, toured the plants, tasted the water, the whole, the whole nine yards. Um, one site we went to down in Orange County, um, they've been operating for about 40 years uh, doing groundwater replenishment, very similar to what we're doing, just on a bigger scale. They actually um, now give out bottles of drinking water from that, that they produce before they put it back into the ground. They're allowed to do that. Arizona also has been doing that. So the water is very pure. And as you can see, there are many plants going on. Pure Water uh, Monterey is constructing right now. Uh, over the hill in Silicon Valley, they've had a project going on. Uh, it's been completed and, and producing water for a while now. So the next thing is, is that timeliness? Mm -hmm. I don't have my glasses. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, we'll have to do it this way. Uh, besides water quality, the most important thing really that our customers said, they said action. I mean, we've been doing, we've been spinning our wheels for 70 years. They said, we want something done, dang it. Actually, they phrase it slightly differently, but I think you get the picture. And uh, they said, do something. So next slide. Um, and so we've taken that to heart as a priority. Now, since that time, since they said you must act, we've got to do something to protect these aquifers. Uh, since that time, the State Water Resources Control Board, our Department of Water Resources, in conjunction with the Depart Department of Water Resources, identified our basin as critically overdrafted. Uh, there's only 21 bases out, out of 500 in the state of California that have this scarlet letter, and we're one of them. 
Now, since that time, this is when reality came crashing down. The Danish government came to us and they said, we know you have this problem. You don't know how far seawater intrusion is offshore in your aquifers. And they said, we have a technology that, that can show you. And we said, really? Do it. They did it. They flew it. And it showed it. Now, what's amazing is the state now has entered a, a memorandum of agreement to share this tech, get more of their <coughs> technology and to share this. Um, so it worked. And that's the beautiful thing. The terrifying thing in my mind is what it showed is that the groundwater, the seawater intrusion in the, is right at the shoreline. And so our hydrologist showed a while back if we did not move our pumping inland and conserve, you know, just temporarily to, to, to adjust, we would, our wells could be hit in, and our main well field could be hit in two years. And we didn't even know how far it was off, but the board took a proactive action at that point. Now, mind you, customers said act, the state then identifies our critical basin, then we do the uh, geophysical technique, and then a couple months ago, Mr. Pete Cartwright, <laughs> who's sitting in the front row, walks into our office and says, I need to talk to somebody. You guys serve my house, but I, I have a 10-acre farm, and it, it's served by a well. And he said, my uh, rent, the farmer who rents the property can no longer farm it. It's gotten hit by seawater intrusion. He had to give, I think, approximately $25,000 back to the farmer because the well has just recently got intruded. So timeliness matters in a solution. And, you know, if you don't believe that, ask Mr. Cartwright. Reliability of a, uh, a solution is also paramount. Um, I don't think uh, anything probably speaks about reliability a little more than uh, recycled water. Um, as somebody said the other day, uh, it may not rain for long periods of time, but hopefully people will always take showers. So <laughs> that kind of stuck in my mind. There's also a couple other things about reliability that are not so much about Pure Water So Kale Project, but we just have to keep in mind. And is that, that is about two weeks ago, the uh, state mandated that uh, some of the streams, the Tuolumne River and some of the other ones, uh, a cutback of 40%. Now this threw water agencies into a frenzy. You probably saw it, uh, San Francisco Public Utilities Commissions and others. I'm not saying that's gonna happen to us, but it, it happened to them and they didn't think it was either. There's also a, um, uh, in, embedded recently in the kind of uh, doctrine of uh, what the state wants to do is that they're recognizing the beneficial, beneficial <coughs> reuse of, the, of water now that goes out to sea. There's approximately 8 million gallons a day of treated affluent, by the way, that goes out to the ocean at Santa Cruz. And they, they're starting to say, they've actually embedded this in the goals that if you are sending uh, treated affluent out to the ocean, uh, you need to make it a priority, number one priority, to reuse some of that. Now on top of that, <coughs> Senator Hertzberg and others have been doing legislation, and we hear it's gonna come back up to actually limit us uh, some of the, from the affluent going out, so we'd have to find a way to use it. And we, we think we have a way. You know, scalability, we didn't see this one uh, coming from our community, but they said uh, they, want it, they want a solution that's scalable, uh, that if, if it doesn't need to produce so much, it, do, it, it doesn't have to. Say we were getting some excess, uh, taking more water from the river. Uh, that's a beautiful thing, we could scale it back. Say uh, the drought hit harder, maybe we could, we could, we could pump the full amount or, or do the full amount, something that was adaptable uh, so it was more efficient. So we think that that, that covers that. Affordability, um, you know, that's always every, somewhere in everybody's uh, values, I think, because money does matter. It may not be the top priority, and it wasn't the top priority. Um, there was another headline that said it wasn't the top for our people, but, but it's important. Um, so we, we looked at what projects, you know, what projects cost. Now, here are, as a comparison, and you can see it, two of the water scenarios that the city of Santa Cruz is considering and that maybe you know, we'll have a chance to partner with um, if they pan out. Uh, that's the engineer's estimated cost, 
And then there's the uh, cost for pure water SoCal right there. I should also say that that's the total cost. When you break it down, just for the project's total cost, uh, to cost per unit of water, pure water SoCal is also less expensive. Now, what these graphs don't include is that the state was down in our office the other day, and uh, they've already invested about $2 million in, in grant funding for planning and education. The feds have also uh, uh, provided us $150,000 for a feasibility study. So they've invested in us, and that's important not just for the money, but it, it sends a signal of a third party review having belief in the project. They don't invest in these things unless they want it to succeed and think it should succeed. So they came down after giving us the two million wanted to see our project, they actually said they think we have the poster child, poster child for preventing seawater intrusion. And so what they did when they went back for the, after, from that visit and they went to Mr. Cartwright's property, matter of fact, they said, we wanna invite you to apply for a $50 million grant. And we've set the money aside and we want you to come back and apply. And so they wrote us a letter and we're, we're gonna be applying for that. So that's what the project would look like. It would cut the cost to our rate payers for the project in half. And there's also federal money out there and they've been talking to us, but it's not even shown. So cost is one thing, but value is another. And so we commissioned Dr. Haddad, who's actually here in the audience tonight, he's a professor up at UCSC, he's written some books on water and economics, to do an economic study on the project. We said, here's the material, do the science, contact us if you need it, him and a, a PhD student went and did it. The result of that study is that Pure Water SoCal Project would be, contribute total economic benefit of almost $1 billion. What it showed is for every dollar invested, you get $9 return on your investment to the economy. It also showed that if you had to do it by conservation, if that would even work and you scale back, you'd pay four, three or four times as much and have to use less water. So I'll round it out with the environment um, because that was also a core value uh, and you know, it's one of mine, it's why I went into water. Um, and I know it is for a lot of people out here. I see some familiar faces and I know you value that. Um, go to the next slide. So uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, emails sent to our board and they were saying, we're concerned about uh, this project uh, using a lot of energy and producing carbon emissions. And believe me, I'm board's very concerned about that. I'll just say Dr. Bruce Daniels, that it, I don't know what age you went back, but uh, it wasn't too long ago and got your PhD in hydrochromatology uh, from UCSC. But so it's, it's always on our mind. And, I, and I'm glad to report out that while Pure Water SoCal may use more energy and probably would than, than some of the other alternatives we're looking at. <coughs> you, you have to realize that it's not, you get what you pay for. Actually, you get more than what you pay for when you're talking about cleaning up water. You can invest a little bit more and get a much, much, much higher quality. I'm talking about hundreds of millions of times more. And that's what pure, pure water SoCal would do versus just traditional treatment on our sources. So beyond that though, it would be all the energy, thanks to Monterey Community Power. I'll sh put out a shout out to Jenny Johnson, because uh, she led this effort. Uh, all the power would be carbon free and produced from green sources such as solar, and the, and the facility would also have solar on it, I should add, but from solar, wind, and, and hydro. 100% carbon free energy. Um, you know, reducing 25% 25, 25 of the 8 million gallons a day on average of fluent that goes out to the ocean seems like a step in the right direction to me. This is actually out down the street from my house. I love this guy. I've seen him surf with his dog. Okay, next slide. Thank you. Um, I'll back up one because I, I do want to say that on the environmental lens, something that, that, that socked me in the stomach when I heard it I actually want to see what the exact quote is. Somebody said to me, 
uh, when I was telling them about these projects and saying, hey, we're getting a little, we're trying to get some water from the North Coast Creeks and from the San Lorenzo River and do recycle. And they looked at me and they go, and, and from the groundwater, and they said, isn't it time we stop taking and start recycling? And you know, when they said that, my whole, my, I shifted. I just went, oh my gosh, isn't it time we stop taking and start recycling? But with that said, I've, I've kind of built up the virtues of Pure Water Soquel. Um, you, okay, we're on that slide. Uh, and, and, we, and we've shown the science, we've, we've gone through the science, it, 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 this project aligns with our community values. Um, I don't think there is one single solution in this, in this region. Um, I'm pretty sure of it. I think it's gonna take a host of solutions and certainly that creates more reliability. So recycle, purification, groundwater recharge, uh, sharing with neighbors, the whole bit. Uh, when we did the opening of the uh, water transfer the other day, uh, Water Commissioner Doug Infer, our Vice Chairman of the uh, Water Commission, said, you know, water systems take a lot of time and there's probably no magic bullet. And I really think he summed it up well. So we really are one community and I think collaboration is, is, is the key. It's, we can't do it alone. No entity, nobody can do this alone. We need each other. And so I thank each of y'all who have contributed comments, put time into it, and for being here tonight. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll turn it now over uh, to Elisa Moore from Environmental Sciences. Thank you. She'll go through kind of the process portion of Pure Water Soquel, and then I think Melanie Mal Schumacher will come up and kind of get into the uh, more meat of the project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me here tonight. Um, again, this is Elisa Moore with Environmental Science Associates, and for the past 25 years, 21 of those with ESA, I've been focusing on uh, supporting the environmental planning of water supply and um, public land use projects. Um, in with a particular focus on helping public agencies complete their obligations under the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA. And tonight, I'm going to walk through the CEQA process that was completed for this project. Um, and, and just as a reminder to everyone, what CEQA is, it, is apply it applies to state and local uh, agency projects and requires that agencies consider environmental impacts before decisions are made, which are the decisions that we're here tonight to, to think through. Um, and for this project, we prepared an environmental impact report, which evaluates in environmental impacts of a project and demonstrates that the impacts can be avoided or re reduced, and also requires that you consider environmental alternatives to the project. <clears throat> So how we started this process was with a public scoping period and the release of a notice of preparation in uh, November of 2016 um, for a public review period that ended in, in January 2017. And we provided this notice of preparation to a number of um, individuals and organizations as well as provided notice in newspapers, libraries, and, webs and on the district's website. Uh, in, in all, we, we um, distributed approximately 7,500 uh, mail and email notices. Um, there were two public meetings held during that time period and the outcome of the public scoping period, um, the main issues that we heard at that time were regarding concerns about use of raw wastewater as a source water for this project, uh, some site-specific environmental concerns about the location of the treatment facilities, and um, some non-environmental concerns. That led the district and the board to go back and think a little bit more about what the project should include. And um, in the end, the project description was revised somewhat and a second and notice of preparation was released <coughs> in June of 2017 uh, for a comment period again that, that ended in July of 22nd. Um, the similarly, uh, we released the notice of preparation to a num through a number of resources and made, um, made those documents available in public libraries as well as on the district's website. We also held one <coughs> scoping meeting um, on the second on the revised notice of preparation before substantively launching into preparation of the EIR for the project. 
The next phase of our project was preparation of a draft EIR, <coughs> um, which was made available to the public in June of 2018, this earlier this year, for a comment period that went through August of 2018, um, and we held one public meeting during the draft EIR review period. <laughs> I have some. <laughs> Sorry, folks, I'm at the tail end of a cold, so I'm a, a little bit hoarse still. Um, and um, similar to the notice preparation, there was quite a wide array of distribution of the, of the availability of the draft EIR. Um, CEQA requires that you provide me the notice of the availability for the draft EIR through a few means, but the district really um, wanted to do a, a fuller um, release and make this document available through many means, um, as you see on this slide here. <coughs> The draft ER that was made available for public, public review and comment focused on um, these project objectives here and means of meeting the project's need to develop 1,500 acre feet of, of supplemental water supply that would replenish the local groundwater basin, for, prevent further seawater intrusion, develop a sustainable water supply in a timely manner, develop an affordable and reliable supplemental water source, diversify and enhance resiliency of the water supply, and produce high quality and safe water supply that also provides additional environmental benefits. In order to achieve those objectives, the project as described in the EIR includes an, a, an arrangement of um, options that would include treatment facilities that would take the secondary effluent from the Santa Cruz water, wastewater treatment facility and um, do advanced purification and move that water to recharge well locations that are on the far side of this graphic that you'll see here. Um, specifically, um, that meant that there were several combinations of treatment locations, pipelines, and recharge locations that were considered and analyzed in the EIR. <coughs> Next slide, please. Um, that this just displays kind of the different variations of treatment uh, that were cons was, was considered on in the EIR, and then on the next slide, you'll see that there, for treatment, there were three specific locations that were analyzed in the EIR for the treatment facilities, um, and those were at the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Facility itself, um, at the Chant what we call the Chanticleer site, which is at the corner of Chant Chanticleer and Soquel, um, and then at the West Headquarters, West Annex site adjacent to the district's headquarters office. <coughs> And it was noted in the EIR that the final configuration would be decided um, based on what we heard from the public and during the scoping period as well as the draft EIR um, analysis uh, if a review period, um, the environmental analysis, other engineering and feasibility considerations as well as continued outreach and, outreach and technical input. <coughs> Under CEQA, we're required to consider the physical environmental impacts on a number of environmental topics that you see here, and the EIR included all of the topics that you see before you here. And in the EIR, there was consideration of both construction and operational impacts. Um, the construction phase is expected to last a total of 36 months, but with different phases of the project and facility types requiring different um, construction periods. The ER concluded that most of the environmental topics would result in less than significant impacts, and those are the items you see in blue. Um, but some of the construction impacts were determined to be significant, um, but that could be mitigated to less than significant levels with mitigation measures. Those are the items that are kind of in the orange, and they included topics such as air quality, biological resources, um, potential cultural resources if they were present, um, and energy conservation needs, hazards and hazardous materials, surface water hydrology, and transportation and traffic. There's one topic that was determined to be significant but unavoidable even with mitigation measures during the construction period, which was noise, because with um, even with mitigation, there wasn't a feasible means to reduce the, the short-term noise um, levels from some construction equipment types um, during the construction period. So that item you'll see in red is determined to be significant, unavoidable with mitigation. For operations, 
after conducting the impact analysis, um, it was determined that all impacts from operational activities would either be, would have no impact because the resources are not present or there would be less than significant impacts. As mentioned, CEQA requires alternatives be considered um, un, for in, within an EIR. And, the EI, and what is required is that the ER evaluate a reasonable range of alternatives that would feasibly obtain most of the project objectives but also avoid or lessen one or more of the significant impacts of the project. In looking at those requirements under CEQA, there were three uh, alternatives that were considered in the in, in the alternatives analysis, the no project alternative, which is required under CEQA, a reduced project that would include a, a 1,200 acre foot per year compared to the 1,500 acre foot per year facility under the project, um, combined with a treated surface water purchase of 300 acre feet per year. The third alternative we considered was a seawater or uh, brackish water desalination plant at 1,500 acre feet per year. The, the discussion of alternatives also considered um, whether other options or alternatives could meet the objectives of the project and um, obtain and reduce or avoid one or more of the significant impacts and be feasible. So there's also a discussion of several alternatives that we determined could not meet um, the requirements of CEQA. The project was determined to be the environmentally superior alternative amongst the alternatives that were analyzed. <clears throat> uh, following the completion of the draft ER comment period, we began preparing the response to comments document, which, <clears throat> which was based on consideration of the 107 uh, comment letters that were received, as well as the eight oral speakers that came to the public meeting and presented comment there. The main themes that we heard and, and, and were provided during the comment period were request to extend the comment period, discussion of CEQA alternatives, preferences amongst the facility sites that were discussed in the project description, um, as well as water quality or public health impacts and some non-CEQA considerations. We also prepared at the, as a result of those comments as well as some staff initiated changes uh, to the project description, a text revision section, which is a, a, which is a brief section of about 30 or so pages, um, that that includes text revisions as well as um, you know, doesn't the, the the text revisions that are required as a res, as a result of um, these changes do not bring any new impacts um, or substantially change the impact analysis that was prepared in the draft ER. So the response to comments and the draft ER together are the final ER and as as completed um, are is not substantially different than what is in the draft EIR. Um, the response to comments document was completed and CEQA requires that you make the response to comments document available to co agencies that have commented um, on the draft EIR at least 10 days before considering uh, CEQA certification. So that document was distributed to commenting agencies on December 7th. Um, in addition, while not required, the district made the um, response to comments document available on their website as well as at their district headquarters and provided a distribution to commenters on the EIR that the document, the response to comments document was available. With that, that leads us to today and I'm gonna now turn this over to Melanie who will talk about the two resolutions that are before you tonight. Great, thank you, Lisa. Just for an introduction, my name is Melanie Mouse Schumacher and I'm the Special Projects Communications Manager <coughs> here at Soquel Creek Water District. I'm also the lead staff person who has been overseeing the evaluation of the proposed Pure Water Soquel project. My background is I am a registered civil engineer, although most of my practice right now is in planning and paperwork. Um, <laughs> but I've also lived here for over 20 years and I am proud to be a groundwater guardian. I'm blessed to have uh, been able to raise two boys here and live and work in this community. Um, I would just like to again say thank you to Ron and to Ms. Moore. I do have just a couple of slides and then we do want to turn it over to the board comments and the public comments. So as the lead staff engineer, I've been overseeing the um, 
environmental analysis for about two and a half years, or more importantly, we counted it, it's 888 days. <laughs> and um, through that time, we're here today to have uh, the final EIR presented to the board for consideration of certifying the EIR. Following that step, if the board does decide to certify the EIR, then they can then consider whether or not to approve the project. So what exactly does certifying an EIR mean? In simple terms, it means that the Soquel Creek Water District Board of Directors, as the lead agency, considers the information within the EIR as complete. The staff recommendation related to certifying the EIR and adopting the resolution that Ms. Ouellette had referred to, which is 1830, states that the final EIR, including the comments, I mean the documents incorporated by reference, have been reviewed and considered by the board. The final EIR has also been completed in accordance with CEQA and the CEQA guidelines. And the final EIR adequately describes the environmental impacts of the proposed project. The final EIR also reflects the board's independent judgment and analysis, and that it is adequate, accurate, and objective. And finally, the response to comments document contains no significant revisions to the draft EIR. <coughs> As we mentioned, we did make the responses to comment document available on our website and at the district office as of last Friday. Since that time, we have received additional input from the public with most of the communication focusing on the topics that you see on the screen. Most of the topics raised included both project support and project opposition, the request for additional time to review the final EIR, the request to have the availability of the responses to document comment in hard copy, which we did have one copy even though it was not required at our district office. There was also a lot of discussion related to the project timeliness relative to water transfer evaluation that I hope uh, Ron addressed. There was also some considerations and discussions related to project cost and energy consumption rel relative to water transfers, the water transfer efficacy and the water system and aquifer capacity, and finally there was some general dis dissatisfaction with the responses that were made to the comments. Um, in reviewing the communications that we've received, and we continue to review them, and we will review them tonight, we, um, the CEQA team thus far has not identified any new environmental issues that were not addressed in the final EIR, and we continue to be in compliance with the CEQA requirements and the CEQA guidelines, and thus our recommendation for the board to certify still stands. So on the screen before you, and it's also in the staff memo, this is the actual text of the motion that we have are proposing to the board to by motion and roll call vote adopt resolution 1830 certifying the final EIR for the Pure Water SoCal project. The other action that we are proposing to the board tonight is also for project approval. If the board decides to certify the EIR, this would be the next step. Again, this is just a process chart showing that if the board decided to approve the project, um, they could direct staff to continue to move on with the design and permitting of the project. As you've heard from the speakers before me, the full environmental review was completed for all project components described in the final EIR. This provided a comprehensive analysis of the range of options and the potential environmental effects. As Ms. Moore has mentioned, the final EIR evalu evaluated these potential effects at three different treatment sites, numerous pipeline alignments, and five potential recharge well sites. For project approval, staff is recommending that the project consist of the following components. A water treatment facility at one or two sites, a pipeline alignment for secondary or tertiary effluent, a pipeline alignment for purified water, and a pipeline alignment for the brine concentrate. And, then, and finally, recharge well and appurtenances for at up to three sites. Further, for project approval, staff is recommending an approach to advance the development and the siting of the components for the Pure Water Soquel project to be tertiary treatment at the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Facility, advanced water purification at Shanna Clear site, and the recharge wells that have been identified to be Twin Lakes Church, 
Monterey Avenue and Willowbrook Lane. I'd like to just take a couple moments to go more in detail of those locations. So at the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Facility, we are uh, recommending to the board to um, develop the tertiary treatment that would be located at the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Facility right next to the existing sedimentation tanks. This wastewater treatment facility is near Neri Lagoon. Once tertiary water was developed over at the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Facility, it would go through pipelines and over to the Chanticleer site, which as was mentioned before, is at Soquel Avenue in Chanticleer, very nearby Staples in West Marine. At this site location, we're proposing that the purification process be developed there. That would include the tr advanced treatment, which would include reverse osmosis and advanced oxidation. Once the purified water was uh, created at that site, then it would go out to our recharge well sites. The recharge well sites, as shown here, are two district-owned properties. At Monterey Avenue, which is near um, Kennedy Drive, and Willowbrook uh, Lane, which is just off of SoCal. The third option would be at the Twin Lakes Church, which is um, near Cabrillo College and off Cabrillo College Drive. So up on the screen is the actual languages again that we're proposing that our board um, approve, which would be if resolution 1830 is adopted by motion and roll call vote, adopt resolution 1831. This would also mean that not only adopting the project, they would adopt the CEQA mitigation and monitoring program, the findings, and the statement of overriding considerations that would be based upon the project that is before them tonight. Thank you, President Mahir. All right, thank you. So um, we will have public comment in a minute. I just wanted to see if there are any questions um, from board members first for staff. Not from me. I want to hear from the public. Yeah, let's, I would like to do that. Okay, all right, I just wanted to make sure. All right, so um, we're gonna open the public comment portion. Um, we should have some speaker cards available um, and we have how many okay so that's still you know an hour and 20 minutes of comment but I think we, I want to make three minutes is our standard so we'll stick with that um, you'll we, we have um, I will call each speaker to the microphone and you'll have those three minutes to make, present your comments to the board. And just as a reminder, we're, we wanna have everyone have a chance to speak. Um, there's no donating of time to other speakers and we're not gonna get into a back and forth dialogue. We're here to just listen. Um, and so. It um, might be efficacious to have the second person come yes. up and stand in. I will, I will give the Yes. I'll give the speaker's name that's coming up and then I'll give the one who's on deck for those of you that, um, so that you're ready to go. Um, when you do take the microphone, um, please speak into the microphone and um, spell your name and identify if you're commenting on behalf of any groups or organizations and if you'd like to state your address for the record. And so, um, number one I have um, Mary Bannister and then in on deck we have Vince Baraba. Good evening. Thank you, President Lahieu, staff, board members, all my friends and community members in the public. I'm Mary Bannister, B A N N I S T E R. I live in the Pajaro Valley Water Management Area, 498 White Road in Watsonville. I'm here as a member of the public, although I did work at the Pajaro Valley Water Management Agency for almost, well, 17 years. And I've recently, because I couldn't get enough, I've just joined the board of directors there. <laughs> right? Is that funny to you? You all might think that's kind of interesting, but. Um, thank you for the work that you all do. I can't think of a board that has more talented individuals on it, and having been in the business for so long, 
I know what a commitment it is. Any of us could be out drinking eggnog tonight, but here you are, and I appreciate that from everyone here who's uh, committed to water resources in the Central Coast area. So being part of the neighbor to the south, I just want to tell you that we s developed recycled water about 10 years ago, and uh, it saved our Central Coast farming, the Pajaro Valley farming in that area, in the Central Coast area of the Pajaro Valley there. Um, there were wells inundated with seawater, and once they are, they're done, and there were farmers that were not going to be able to farm. But um, we developed a clean, drought-proof uh, supply of recycled water that now has been being uh, supplied to that agricultural area for over 10 years. Uncooked crops, fresh raw crops, strawberries, celery, lettuce, all of those are being irrigated. Never a problem, never a documented problem with that anywhere that I'm aware of. Um, edible row crops. Is that three minutes? What? Nope. That's just One a warning go. that you've got oh, a minute phew. left. Because I'm just warming up. <laughs> <laughs> Our board of directors made a very risky decision, and it took guts for them to commit to the project that we built. We were in lawsuits. As many of you know, we were under lots of criticism. The farmers are very nervous about using that water. But here we are, 10 years later, this year no water went out the outfall. So all water is good water. It just needs to be treated and used for what it's appropriate for. And so uh, our board made a gutsy decision, and I encourage you all to do the same. Um, once our project kicked off, it wasn't the perfect project. It still isn't. Yours isn't perfect either. They don't have to be perfect. But they have to be a project that makes sense, that the community can commit to. And once you get going, the pieces will fall into place. Grant funding came to the tune of $80 million we got in grant funding. And this is an agency that was on the verge of bankruptcy when we broke ground. So that's remarkable. Um, as your neighbor to the south, and as someone who's got some trail dust, maybe a thick coating of it, I encourage you to move forward, keep up the good work, and thank you. Thank you, Mary. All right, thank you. And next is Vince Faraba, and then on deck is um, Dan Kriege. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just put a little background on why what I want to say a little bit later. I had the opportunity to serve in fairly large government positions as the director of the Census Bureau. As I look around, I think I counted you all in 1980. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I've also had uh, pos executive positions in very large corporations. The reason I bring that up is that I reviewed the report that was done by the professor at uh, UC Santa Cruz. And I think it was very well done because it's the type of report that is hard to do because there's so much uncertainty related to the assumptions that have to be made about the future. And I think they did a, a very good job of addressing that issue and putting it in a, in a, in, in a form that allowed the, the reader to see and to understand that the conclusion they came to is, seems pretty solid. Th there was one thing, however, that uh, I was thinking about. I uh, came to uh, Capitol in uh, nearly 30 years ago, and um, I, I, I got to admit I came here because I was looking to invest in property. <laughs> Thank God I did it then. <laughs> but um, the one thing that, uh, that didn't pop out of that report that uh, was important to me is there was very, they listed very well the concerns related to what could happen to businesses and, uh, and things of that nature. But, you know, when, when you make an investment in property, you do so with the understanding that the economics of the society could have an effect on the value of the property. And that's a risk that you're willing to take. But what not having water does, it has a significant risk on the value of your property because if you ever wanted to sell it, you'd have to explain to somebody that what we normally do in our houses with water, you can't do here because we're under uh, limitations as to the access to the water. So as someone who now has two pieces of property in Capitola, uh, I, I, I really thought that job was well done, and I'm 
very much in, uh, in support of what uh, is in front of you today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So uh, next we have Dan Kriege and on deck would be Craig Wilson. Good evening. Uh, as I said, I'm Dan Kriege. I've been in the water business for about 60 years and served on this board 40 years and uh, was a member and chairman of the California Water Commission. I'd just like to make two or three points tonight. One of them is that I was responsible for advanced wastewater treatment in Palo Alto years ago. And we not only took the secondary treated water in Palo Alto, but we made it primary water and drinking water. But more interesting was NASA was our partner in that project. And they were testing how we treated water and how we treated that water to a drinking water level. Because if you're going to go to Mars, you're going to drink your water many, many times. So they had to recycle this water quickly. The process works, and as Ron pointed out, the process is working in many areas throughout California. Another point is I was responsible for three large water treatment plants in Silicon Valley, Los Gatos, Almaden Valley, and uh, East San Jose. And around these plants are homes. And many people are worried that if you build a treatment plant near a home, you'll reduce the value of the property. Those homes sitting above the Rincon Auto Water Treatment Plant in Los Gatos are multi-million dollar homes. And I might say that there's probably not a home along Capitola Avenue that's quite valuable as those homes are. Uh, I looked around and I know there's going to be people tonight who will speak against this project and they'll have valid concerns. But also, you have to remember, there are tens of thousands of people who are not here tonight. And these people are the ones that are saying to you, we've given you the responsibility to have a water supply for us and to protect our groundwater basin. You've given that you have this responsibility now. And I would say, approve this project and get it moving. And also, I would also encourage this board to get off their collective rear ends and get out to the public and explain to the public that they need this project and you have to have this project. Otherwise, these hammers that are talked about are going to fall on this district. And so you ran on the board, you ran for this board telling us you had great leadership. I'd like to you to go out to the public and show us that leadership. Thank you, Dan. Um, so next is Craig Wilson and on deck is Adele Gardner. I am Craig Wilson. I uh, live on North Main Street in SoCal. I've been following the general water issues and our troubles for many years now. Uh, I'm very pleased that we have an opportunity to move forward now because it's been a long time since we had any options. So I would um, ask the board to uh, uh, certify the EIR and approve the project. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Adele Gardner, and then next will be uh, Monica McGuire. Hi, my name is Adele Gardner. It's spelled A-D-E-L-E-G-A-R-D-N-E-R. -E -E I live at 319 Loyola Drive in Aptos. Um, I've lived in this district for 20 years. It's been a problem for 20 years. I am so happy to see you guys on the brink of taking action. You have worked so hard. I want to congratulate the people that just got elected. I think that the voters spoke and said they were really excited to have you guys take action follow through on your plan, follow the science. And, and I would say that supports uh, the previous speaker saying that all the people not in this room are saying, do this, get something done. Um, I appreciate how much work you've done over the years in conservation, that the work you do to uh, cooperate with partners throughout our community, not just in our district, but across the district um, and the county. Um, your diligence and research has so paid off. You guys have been so dedicated in getting this job done. Detail-oriented, the outreach you've done has been spectacular. Thank you. Um, your job is to protect and preserve our aquifer for the future generations. Uh, to me, this is the biggest environmental project and the biggest environmental threat that our community faces, and it's in your hands. Um, it's your public trust. We are trusting you to do something. And um, I hope that you will take the time now, tonight, to be brave, be bold, take action, and do something for us and for future generations, people that will live here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Monica McGuire is next, and then on deck we have Kenneth Gerard. I'm Monica McGuire. I still work in this district um, in Aptos, and I now live at 20 Mahalo Meadow Drive 
in uh, Coralitos. I wholly and heartedly disagree with everyone who's spoken already as members of the public. I find, having come to multiple meetings, that you have not honestly addressed most of the concerns that I and others who have donated thousands of hours attempting to assist you to see the plain facts that this is a boondoggle over expensive choice at this point. It could very well be that this is something that has a place after the uh, water transfer pilot project is complete. However, having put that off, the multiple years that you've put it off and not knowing whether that could solve our problem at a fraction of the cost, and saying that your reason for not doing it is because you don't trust Santa Cruz City is reprehensible. And I have met dozens and dozens who agree entirely. They are not the thousands out there thinking you've done a good job. They're the thousands who didn't learn about the meetings that you said were public meetings that I attended and found out that they weren't public meetings. They were places for you to do more cover up, misrepresentation, and strange play with words in order to make this sound better than it is. We have enough voices that have been misrepresented on these slides here tonight again, making very real concerns evident and clear, and they have been ignored and not answered. And we feel incredibly frustrated by this. We feel misled, misrepresented, and quite angered, you might get, from my voice at this point, knowing that you have people standing here saying that they believe you need to be brave to do this. We think you're crazy without finding out what less expensive options have been laid at your doorstep with great care for years. We hope that you will take more time to let the water transfer pilot project complete and find out if we could save the small number of ratepayers in this district enough money to let us continue to live here. A 9% raise for nine years straight or whatever it is, is ridiculous. If we have this massive growth coming with the Silicon Valley coming over, wait until they are resident here in the overcrowded housing planned by this very strange set of choices in this county and let them help us pay for it. We should not be paying for a whole future of the Silicon Valley taking over our jobs so that they have better water in case they want it. And there is Thank you. So much more you could be doing first. Please Thank you. take w a recess and don't push this through. Thank you. So next is Kenneth Girard, and uh, following him will be Larry Freeman. Good evening. My name is Kenneth Girard. I live at 639 Bayview Drive in Aptos, California. I've lived here since November of 88. I'm a retired water wastewater engineer. Um, during my career uh, in that field, I worked for the city of Wattsville, San Lorenzo Valley Water District, and also the Sunnyvale Water District, in which I worked in various water, recycled water and wastewater projects. I do um, like to, first of all, congratulate the board here, the staff, as well as the board and the staff of the city of Santa Cruz and the county of Santa Cruz for recognizing the importance of recharging the mid-county groundwater basin. Uh, this particular project is a step in that direction as discussed in the EIR. This particular project would meet all of the community uh, standards and requirements. It would meet all the project objectives. It would provide safe water in a cost-effective manner. I strongly support this project. The proposed project um, does not depend upon seasonal water, which is only available in wet years, as some of the other proposals are for transfers. It also has a lower energy cost and uh, global warming impact than it, uh, the pr other alternatives of desal. Um, it does not compete with the city of Santa Cruz use of surface water. It will utilize a resource which is currently underutilized, i.e. wastewater. Um, it will successfully recharge the mid-county groundwater basin, which is 
important to do in a very timely fashion before more people lose their wells to groundwater intrusions. I do urge the board to consider carefully the EIR and the process for the EIR and take the appropriate action after reviewing all comments this night. Finally, as a member of a joint task force before, when I worked at Sunny Slope County Water District, we had the members of the staff of all the institutions review the project, as well as two members of the elected boards of the project review it, along with the consultants. Uh, this technical advisory committee made a final recommendation regarding the exact location of each and every facility and um, all boards and staff were very confident of the project at that and it moved forward very successfully. So I would uh, encourage you to make sure that the staff of both agencies, the board of both agencies and the consultants working for all agencies are comfortable with all the components of the project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, next is Larry Freeman followed by Barbara Graves. Hello, my name is Larry Freeman, F-R-E-E-M-A-N. I'm a resident of Capitola and a customer of Soquel Creek Water District. First, I'd like to say congratulations on the completion of the final EIR for the Pure Water Soquel project. I've been watching the evolution of the project for ne nearly three years now, attending numerous board meetings, public workshops, and participating as a public member on two uh, supplemental, the Water Supply Committee and the Water Resources Management Standing Committee. This project is vital for the protection of our groundwater supply against seawater intrusion and for providing a safe, reliable, and sustainable water supply. The project is really the only current option on the table that is under the control of the district. Service water transfers from the city of Santa Cruz will be feasible at some point in time, but that is several years down the line. It's worth reiterating that surface water transfers from the city beyond the current small pilot project cannot proceed until the city has received approval from the state to update their water rights to the San Lorenzo River. The city posted a notice of preparation on October 15th. That document gives a clue as to the length of the time required to change water rights. The link to that document is highlighted on page 243 of the board packet tonight. Um, this approval process will take several years when and if the city gets the okay from the state, it could take several more years for the city to decide how they would like to share those rights and then go through the EIR process for any plans and projects. The city, the district is not the only wa local water agency interested in obtaining water through the changes to the city's rights. There have been concerns expressed about the ability of the advanced water purification technology to provide a safe water supply and prevent contamination of the groundwater basin. I prefer to base my opinions on facts <clears throat> produced by sound science and the input from experts in the field. This technology is not new and it is constantly being improved. The National Water Research Institute has given its expert blessing to the Pure Water Project. I trust the science and I trust their opinion. Numerous comments on the draft EIR reflect a concern about the location of the advanced water purification facility. Many support the project, but not the West Annex site. I see that the board plans to approve the project for the Chanticleer location. I think that's a wise move for a number of reasons. Uh, given the critically overdrafted designation of our groundwater basin, we cannot afford to wait for a project that might happen at some point in time. In lieu, service water transfer, deep water desal, and stormwater capture are still on the table as part of the district's community water plan and should still be pursued. Eventually, some or all of these options will be necessary for a resilient water supply, not only for district's customers, but for the Santa Cruz County region a diversity of water supply options will provide stability. There is no single solution to this regional problem. I want to say thanks for the hard work and dedication of the district staff, the numerous highly skilled consulting firms, the numerous constructive public comments, and the astute guidance by the Board of Directors. We are now able to take substantial action towards achieving a safe, reliable, and sustainable water supply. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Um, Barbara Graves and then followed by Barbara would be um, Becky Steinbrenner. My name is Barbara Graves. I live in Capitola and I have been an environmental activist for half a century in the area of water. It started when my family and my friends began to die from polluted groundwater. And make no mistake, salt is pollution. 
it's time to absolutely stop this. I mean, the staff was very polite leaving out the study that showed that salt water is active and has been active, drawn in under Live Oak by initially by the Belts Wells, by the city of Santa Cruz. I mean, it's very bad. We cannot wait any longer. And on the little road that um, Ron Duncan put up on the, on the screen there, I started on that road 25 years ago when I represented the Conservation Committee of the Sierra Club on the cities, the city of Santa Cruz's water input committee. At that point, desalinization was unanimous as the most environmentally friendly option. Then I served on the um, Soquel Creek Water Advisory Committee, and I also served for the Democratic Party on the um, and Commission on the Environment for the, Democratic, the California Democratic Party. And through all of those, I have never seen a board that is more qualified, more dedicated to the environment than you folks are. I respect all of you. I don't have to agree with you, but please certify this EIR. I'm one of those crusty old anal retentive environmentalists. I actually read the EIR. And it's, it's good, it's really good. You should certify it and move forward with whatever's fastest and prevent this pollution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, after um, Becky Steinbrenner on deck would be Steve Wart, I think, that, or Wait. It's interesting. Wait. He's a large contractor. Becky Steinbrunner from Aptos Hill, Steinbrunner, S-T-E-I-N-B-R-U-N-E-R. -E I feel there are a number of inadequate responses and a lack of information and downright um, inaccuracies in the draft EIR that your board, with good uh, due diligence, needs to address to keep your board and the ratepayers from being sued in the future. Um, I don't have time to go into all of them, but briefly, um, I have not even had time to comment on my own, or review my own comments, responses, instead choosing to pay attention in these 10 very short days that you have given the public to focus on Mr. Ricker and Mr. Adler's uh, expert opinions and concerns and the lack of response to them in the EIR. Um, in, uh, Mr. Ricker points out that the e draft EIR did not uh, show true locations of any private wells in the models. They were all simulated. This was uh, dismissed in the response. Mr. Ricker also points out the draft EIR does not adequately address uh, potential soil contamination sites and actually says that it is inaccurate information because there are many contamination sites that are closed, but were closed because of their high cost and low benefit, but they are in direct locations that your conveyance lines would go. This is dismissed in the response. Um, Mr. Ricker and Mr. Adler both point out that this project dismisses cooperation with county's plans in the forced main alignment projects and there needs to be a new bridge put across the San Lorenzo River that it would behoove both agencies, all agencies to cooperate. Your response says you do not intend to do so. The draft EIR says that uh, the um, rodeo basin is over capacity. Mr. Adler states that. The response dismisses that. And I may point out there is a five-story medical facility in a 700-car parking garage planned for that area. Um, I want to say that your ac it is uh, inaccurate that your draft EIR says there is no plan for anything except groundwater injection into the uh, basin for seawater when your board approved last to, uh, meeting to use as a gift to give Twin Lakes three and a half acre feet of purified water every year for 50 years to irrigate their, their athletic fields. That is an irrigation project, but the draft EIR says there is no plan for using the treated water for irrigation. Finally, I want to give you a petition. Thank you. 
of 190 people who want to vote on this as we, as we have been asking for since you began. Thank you very much. I'd like to Mr. submit Mr. Steve Waite will be next, and after him will be um, Rick Longinati. Sorry, how do I pronounce your last name, sir? I didn't quite read it correctly, did I? Yeah, my name is uh, Steve Waite. I'm a yeah, resident okay. of Santa Cruz County and soon to be customer of Silk Hill Water District. Hopefully, house sale will go into in January. Um, I have a uh, recovering oceanographer. Um, I've been in the water business for almost 25, 30, 30 years. Uh, in fact, my children have had a unique, probably the, the only kids have had tasted wastewater reuse from five water reuse plants and two desal plants. So I don't think any more kids have done it more than my kids and I. So as in the, in the business, but as a, as a resident of the county, I want to make sure that uh, the board understands that this is the right way to go. This is the future. This is one of the portfolio management tools that many districts are, are uh, considering and it is the positive way to go. There are a lot of options out there and it's a tough job to do to, do, to, to mitigate you know, all the different um, um, issues, but I think from a water shortage point of view and base management, time, timing management point of view, this is the direction to go to. And uh, um, I have no effects of drinking wastewater for many years, so I, I can be, be proof of that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and then uh, Rick Longinati, and then after that will be John Leopold. Good evening, board members. Um, I just want to start out by uh, recognizing you with appreciation for your dedication to restoring the aquifer. I, I think around 2002, three gentlemen on the, on the board here uh, got on the board uh, it, with a district that was ignoring for 20 years an overdrafting of the aquifer. And, and you all have turned that around. And uh, first of all, with the desalination proposal, which uh, I would have supported had it been the only way to recover the aquifer, because I think it's a worse uh, outcome to lose the aquifer than it is to build the most in energy intensive kind of water infrastructure there is, which is desalination. And now you're on to a, a, a better solution from an energy point of view, about half as energy intensive as desalination. I was disappointed that the IR did not fully consider the water transfers with Santa Cruz. We had, uh, I was on the Water Supply Advisory Committee. We recommended and the City Council unanimously adopted water transfers as the number one strategy for drought resilience for Santa Cruz. And um, you had a letter from uh, Water Director Rosemary Menard saying that she was looking for a synergy with the district that uh, Santa Cruz's problems and the SoCal district's problems could be solved. Um, the, the EIR did say that the water transfers had the potential of supplying 1,500 acre feet per year, which is your goal. Um, so I don't know why it wasn't uh, looked at. It was put into the alternative for not, not to be considered further. So I don't think you've missed that opportunity in entirely. Um, I would suggest that uh, that actually the district uh, take a leadership role in looking at water transfer possibilities because otherwise you're just going to be re responding to whatever Santa Cruz puts forward. And Santa Cruz is going to put forward what's good for them, which is what they should put forward. Uh, but it won't necessarily uh, be optimized for the recovery of the aquifer that you're looking for. Um, and I haven't seen the district up to now become active in actually looking at the strategies for uh, water transfer that might be optimal for you guys. I'm worried that if you, if you approve the project tonight that you won't have the money to do uh, much of anything else. Um, and so I'm, I'm sad about that. So I'm, I'm asking if you can think on your feet here tonight, if you can find a way that if you do approve a pro this project or, or set yourself on a path towards it that you can find ways to leave it if you find a better solution. Um, uh, that you maybe do the investments that make sense for you first that could be uh, used, you know, for example, it install the injection wells, which could be used for uh, wastewater, recycled water, or could be used for river water. I mean, do the kinds of things that, that uh, don't delay your project, but that could be used for various alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John Leopold, and following him will be Gary Lindstrom. 
Uh, good evening, board. Uh, my name is John Leopold. I'm a Santa Cruz County Supervisor. I have the great pleasure of representing both Live Oak and Soquel. I live on Gross Road. And I'm here tonight to say that I support the need for the Soquel Creek Water District to pursue a treatment facility to meet the water supply needs and mitigate the impact of seawater uh, intrusion along the coastline. Uh, I've shown that support by writing letters of support for grant applications uh, for the Pure Water Soquel project, uh, speaking to my constituents and sharing information with constituents in my district about uh, this project. Um, I understand that the scope and scale of this project, uh, there were some early concerns about what it really was, about did it involve raw sewage, uh, and uh, I worked hard to uh, help educate uh, my constituents and dispel the rumors about what this project was really about. Um, I think the EIR has validated those early discussions and showed what this project really is, and uh, I think it's a good EIR. Um, but I have two concerns. Uh, uh, as uh, a representative of uh, unincorporated area, the water decisions that get made in Live Oak are currently made by uh, a, a board that has, and which Live Oak residents have no representation on that board. Uh, on page two and three of the item discussing the CIR, the district uh, considered multiple project sites to allow for flexibility in responding to the interest of local jurisdictions, technical uncertainties, envir and environmental and economic considerations. Uh, first, uh, given that the staff is now recommending Chanticleer as the preferred location for the Santa Cruz uh, wastewater treatment facility and advanced water purification treatment, I want to clearly articulate that in my opinion, this site is not in the interest of the County of Santa Cruz from an economic development standpoint because the newly proposed medical office building being proposed just down the street uh, will significantly change the economic value of the property and the opportunities that we have uh, for that property. There is l less than 12% uh, of the properties in Live Oak are, are uh, commercially zoned. This is one of those places having a major facility in the medical office building means that this property becomes more valuable to the economic health of our community. Uh, second, by recommending the Chanticleer site, uh, staff is recommending that district customers support the most expensive alternative since the district would have to buy this property instead of using it at e either of the two other locations proposed. The medical office building greatly raises the, uh, the cost of that and uh, it will be probably be between two and three million dollars and my understanding is your grant will not cover those costs. So I ask that, that your staff, who's been well aware of these issues for a while, uh, work with uh, the county. I will continue uh, to work with you to advocate for sites that are more appropriate uh, for, uh, for this facility. And I encourage you to think about those people who do not have a voice in this process, uh, uh, but deserve to be considered as part of your considerations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Gary Lindstrom is, is up now, and um, after him is Robert Singleton. Hi, Gary Lindstrom, resident of Aptos for over 50 years. A um, few things I want to bring up. Um, there was only one copy of the EIR um, that people could look at. I've been out of town several days and found out that uh, today was the last day for the um, responses. So. Um, I just don't think that the board or the staff have done everything they can do to get this out and let the public have a look at it. And surely a 740 page uh, document uh, can't be looked at and, and deciphered in 10 days, especially when there's only one copy of it at the office, at the um, district office. Uh, should have been in the libraries, and um, uh, not everybody has a computer, so if it was on the computer on the um, website, then, you know, that's fine for people that have computers, but some people don't. Some people live in areas where they don't get reception to use com computers. Uh, second, I wanted to bring up the... Um, uh, Oh, the comment on the reports and the studies that were made uh, that <clears throat> the PWS, um, Pure Water Soquel, uh, is less expensive than uh, the transfer program. Uh, it doesn't make any difference what you 
uh, pay somebody, it's what what you want out of the reports. And if you give them certain information and things like that and you pay them the right prices, you get the answers you want. I'm sure that on the same uh, reports, if I had paid for them, the answers probably would have been different. Um, the other facilities that you mentioned that are using the uh, pure water system are much, much larger districts by tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. This is a horrible economic burden on the ratepayers of this district. The grant money that you talk about is reimbursement grants. There's no, there's no guarantee that that's gonna come through. So to gamble like this without having the money in the bank to pay for it or at least make it reasonably affordable is wrong. Um, another thing on the transfer program, why has it taken so long for this to happen? This water has been there for hundreds and thousands of years. Why wasn't it thought of earlier? Why did it take citizens to put the program together? Thank you. Um, next is Robert Singleton and after him will be Jane Paradise. Good evening, my name is Robert Singleton and I'm speaking on behalf of the Santa Cruz County Business Council. Uh, my name is uh, R-O-B-E-R-T-S-I-N-G-L-E-T-O-N. Um, so again, I'm speaking uh, as representative of the Santa Cruz County Business Council. We're a consortium of the 80 or so largest employers throughout the county. Um, we've been following this project closely for as long as I've been on the council, so about six plus years, if not more. Um, hearing directly from district staff, uh, some of your board have come and spoken with us about our concerns. From the business perspective, uh, the most important consideration for us is having access to a sustainable and reliable source of water. That is paramount consideration. Um, and to us, after years of development, 20 years of studying the issue, and you know, a partnership with the city of Santa Cruz that didn't work out the way people thought it would, uh, this is by far the best project um, that has, could be brought forward to meet the needs of the district and hopefully recharge the aquifers. Not only is it scientifically proven having vet by experts from all, all ranges and countries and uh, you know, Stanford University um, to look at the actual impacts and what it would do, but it's gone through a whole community consensus building process that involved joint district meetings, that involved the Water Supply Advisory Commission, and those are still, uh, still inputs that we've all taken to get to this point right now, to make a decision. Unfortunately, you can't rely on the city of Santa Cruz. Um, if precedent says anything, it's that while the partnership exists and, and uh, to transfer water potentially, you don't know what the city's gonna do, you don't know what that council is gonna do, and you can't rely on them when the, your future, your aquifers are the ones on, on the line. Um, in regards to economic development and the site, in particular the Chanticleer site, um, there is no housing near there. Right now there's a lot of underutilized, dilapidated facilities there. Yes, it may be a valuable commercial spot in the future, but right now the most pressing economic concern for our businesses and for the business community as a whole is having a safe and reliable access to water. Um, that's hampering tons of different projects in the, in the so-called district, from your ADU, will serve permits, to larger development projects which could help ease uh, the housing crisis that we're in, which is the worst our community has ever faced. So taking all these considerations, uh, to the decision before you tonight, it pretty, it's a pretty straightforward decision. This is the clearest alternative to helping to meet the needs and providing water for the future of all the Mid-County District uh, residents. So I urge you to support this project and you have the full support of our Board of Directors. Thank you. Um, next will be Jane Paradise and following um, Jane will be Andy Gear. Hi, sorry, short. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, Hi, I'm Jane Paradise, P-A-R-A-D-I-S-E. Um, I live on Rosedale Avenue, uh, right next to the West Annex site. I literally, if you wave out the window, I can wave back. That's how close I am to the West Annex site. Uh, first, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, comment on the final EIR and, and the project approval before the board tonight. I'm speaking on behalf of myself as well as the others from our SoCal Village neighborhood community, which surrounds the West Annex site on all four sides. We completely support 
the district's well-researched recommendation that the industrial wastewater recycling project be appropriately located at the Chanticleer site and the Santa Cruz uh, wastewater site, both of which are zoned industrial. To re-emphasize, both the Chanticleer and the Santa Cruz wastewater sites are already zoned industrial. People who work and live there already do so with the full understanding and acceptance of the industrial use location. However, placement of such an industrial facility at the West Annex site, which is zoned R1 residential, would be a violation and a misuse of this highly residentially zoned neighborhood. Because these industrial zone sites are available for this industrial use, it would be difficult to justify placing this type of industrial facility in a residentially zoned neighborhood such as the West Annex. Wastewater treatment, whether it's raw sewage or secondary or tertiary treated water, it's not appropriate in a residentially, highly residentially zoned neighborhood. Um, I wanted to also give you a context of the Soquel Village. There's, there's a master Soquel Village plan where they downgraded the zoning um, in the 90s to, to um, minimize industrialization and commercialization. So a, so a uh, M1 went down to a C1 and then they made a, uh, on the majority residential because they wanted it a livable community. And in fact, in fact, the West Sonics Annex site is on that map and it's designated residential. That community made a commitment to minimize commercialization and industrialization. So that West Annex site is, is um, it would be violating that SoCal Village plan by being, putting anything but something that would be residential oriented. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Andy Gear, and then followed um, by Brent Haddad. Thank you. Uh, President Liu and members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight about taking the next step towards a uh, new water supply for the region. Um, I'm a longtime uh, resident of the city of Santa Cruz. I'm a registered civil engineer, and I've worked my entire career, more than a quarter of a century, in uh, public water supply in California. Uh, starting out as a, uh, an engineer with the Division of Drinking Water in SoCal Creek Water District was a system that I regulated way uh -huh. back when. So I'm very familiar with the area, and in fact, that's what brought me to, um, to the region. Um, since then, I've worked 23 years uh, with the um, San Jose Water Company. Started off in uh, water treatment and water quality, and uh, you stick around long enough, they make you president, and that's what I do now. So I'm <laughs> very involved in water supply planning and um, have made a career out of that. I'm very passionate about it. I go to a lot of meetings for my job, but I'm here tonight um, as a private citizen that just has a passion for water and for sort of doing the right, the right thing. Um, I understand that uh, there's limited resources uh, for water supply in the county, and I also understand that integrated resource planning makes a lot more sense than um, doing planning by, uh, you know, political jurisdictions or service area boundaries, um, and accordingly, um, I think that this project uh, is, is beneficial uh, both to the uh, SoCal Creek um, Water District uh, customers as well as in the city that, that I live in. And you know, the integrated resource planning, we've heard a lot about um, water transfers and things, but in water supply, there's, there's never just one solution, right? And, um, but you do need to solve the most important problems um, first. So um, in my company, I'm supporting um, our wholesale agency in a similar partnership in a very similar project just on a much larger scale. So San Jose Water Company serves about a million souls in uh, six communities in Silicon Valley. We get most of our water from the Santa Clara Valley Water District. They are uh, planning a very similar project and it's um, getting the support of my company um, for three really important reasons. One, it's a reliable drought proof source of water. It's a new source of water uh, for the for the county. Um, the treatment processes are robust and proven. The science is there. I think um, you've sort of demonstrated that through your own research. You haven't taken anybody's word for it. Um, and it's a sustainable supply that makes use of water resources that would otherwise uh, go to waste. Um, the Santa Clara Valley Water District's been operating their advanced water treatment um, 
advanced water purification project for uh, about four years now. There's a tremendous amount of data there. I've drank the water. I think we can kind of put to bed the issue that there, there's a safety issue. Um, I think that those three principles apply in SoCal Creek Water District um, with one other that you have this looming problem of seawater intrusion. So I urge you to approve the EIR and um, move forward with the project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Brent Haddad is next and following uh, Mr. Haddad will be uh, Bill Smallman. My name is Brent Haddad. I live in Santa Cruz. Um, I recommend that you certify the EIR this evening. Um, uh, it's thorough and uh, clear and uh, I think the comments were well uh, responded to. Um, there was a concern about getting a time extension uh, because some people felt they didn't have enough time to comment. Uh, my sense is that although not everyone had time to comment, um, their neighbors came through for them. And there were, uh, I, I felt that the uh, discussion covered all the bases and, and the responses were thorough. Uh, now, uh, as, as a professor who studies water, I've studied multiple EIRs and the processes in which they were either uh, adopted or not. And I just wanted to comment that it's common to get a comment that there's a panacea that was not properly considered and that's why we should postpone the decision. Uh, and in this case, the panacea is the water transfer project. My sense is that the uh, EIR was correct in giving it consideration but saying that it's not a viable alternative uh, for the, uh, the needs that the region has. So, um, I, so I would just say that it's, it's not surprising that that comes up because that's, that's the, the panacea in this case. In terms of whether the project should be green lighted tonight, um, I also recommend that you go ahead with it. Um, the study I did over the summer showed that for every dollar of cost to build this uh, project, it's going to produce $8.6 of benefit for the region. Um, there are some things that weren't mentioned. Uh, those were the, uh, uh, in the absence of this project, uh, our study found that it would exacerbate the region's homelessness and it would also cost 4% of the employment in the uh, district region. And so there are, uh, and I'd say what's different today between the last 70 years and now and why the uh, board should act tonight is that uh, the crisis is real and it's now, it was recognized 70 years ago, but, but now the uh, extent of it is, is known and so it's time to act. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haddad. Um, and Mr. Smallman is next, and following him is George Mead. Hello, Bill Smallman, uh, servant director of San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Um, congratulations to all the new members that were reelected onto the board. I, I do believe it's a bit premature to approve this EIR. You know, I, I do believe that the responses back from the 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 um, the that were not efficient. I was I wasn't really happy with the, actually the responses back from my um, my comments. Um, I my, you know that I'm on the side of recycled water. I was here about a couple years ago promoting toting recycled water, and hey, I won. <laughs> you know, because you know I totally agree with everybody's comment about. Um, recycle water. The wa I believe it's such a positive thing to do now. I know there's there's some wiggle worm with the design, and I've I, I promoted and I'm I I actually submitted my resume as a construction uh, estimator. As Mr. Gerd knows, I've worked I've submitted estimates for San Jose water construction projects for years, so I'm an expert, and that's the reason why I put my resume on the comments. And, but the comments came back and they didn't really understand that fact that I believe that you can put a large pipeline on the railroad corridor. 
And basically, to, to achieve the same purpose of what you want to achieve is to inject this uh, amount of water. But my, I believe that since it's, you're talking about $90 million of the tax, your ratepayers' money, or uh, pub, the public's money, at this project. So I believe, please consider careful design to, to develop a project that can expand. You've stated that you're in possibly interested into um, getting deep water desal water or, or whatever. I'm not saying that my project is the best design, but I do believe it's the most cost effective um, design to, to put some careful thought uh, for, for future planning. I know that you want a certain amount of water, but just think about perhaps down, we can pump this water down to Watsonville. Perhaps we can pump this water to the North Coast farmers or, or whatever. Let's try to make f future plans so you can make full use of the water that comes out of the wastewater plant. And that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying the thing. But if you just go ahead and put a simple pipeline plan with small pot diameter pipeline, you might, you might not have that possibility. So just give that, keep that in your thoughts. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, George Mead is next, followed by John Mukhar, M-U-K-H-A-R, I think. Hi, good evening. I'm George Mead. I'm a customer of the City of Santa Cruz Water Department. Um, I would like to remind everybody of something that seems rather obvious to me. Um, it's not just Monterey Bay. It's Monterey Bay, the Marine National Sanctuary. And your project is going to keep hundreds of millions of gallons of wastewater each year from flowing into a national marine sanctuary. That is a good thing for the environment. I wish the city of Santa Cruz would follow suit and also reduce their discharge of wastewater into the national marine sanctuary. That would be a good thing for not only the national marine sanctuary, but it would be helpful for them to meet the fish flow requirements. <coughs> Speaking of fish flows, that is a concern that you should collectively have in terms of relying on water transfer from the city of Santa Cruz. What you need to provide your customers is a safe and reliable water supply. Reliability from the city of Santa Cruz is a function of the fish flows and also the weather, drought. That's something to be concerned about very, very much. Um, in closing, I would also like to mention that it may seem like there have been a lot of comments on the EIR and there are a lot of people attending these meetings, but it's actually only a very small percentage of your customer base. And if you want to see a large volume of people coming out in massive numbers, then don't go down the road of not supplying a safe and reliable water supply and that when people turn on their tap in their home, either nothing comes out or it's salty water then you're going to see a large public reaction. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, the next on John Mukhar, and then uh, following him is Bill Coker. Good evening, um, Honorable Board President Lathy and uh, board members. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. My name is John Mukhar, and I live in, uh, on Semple Avenue in Aptos. Um, I've been working in the water and wastewater environmental issue for about over 30 years now, and I have um, worked with different cities and consultants, and I've seen this. I uh, support and recommend that you uh, certify that EIR tonight and approve the project. Um, I've talked to agencies and worked with agencies up and down the state, and uh, Ron had showed the map of how many agencies have adopted projects similar to this one. And in all cases, this is the way to go. To go. Um, you have to um, go into a, a pure water SOCAL um, and implement a project like this. In every case that I talk to an agency or a district that uh, looked at water rights uh, transfers, they're avoiding that because of the uncertainty and the other, all the other legal issues that go, go with it, the issues with uh, in droughts, who gets the water first, uh, and all of the other uh, concerns that go with it, and thus all, almost all of them avoided it. Um, and again, a lot of the same things that uh, other people said about rely safe, reliable, and, and economical, and this is the 
approach to go. I teach part-time at San Jose State University the environment, civil and environmental courses, the advanced courses, and I give a challenge to my graduate students in wastewater treatment to stop, we need to stop calling it wastewater treatment and start calling it pure water treatment and not design these plants or update these plants where it's being treated to be discharged, but it's being treated to be reused uh, on, uh, for indirect or indirect water recharges or anything like that. Again, I support, uh, I recommend that you approve, uh, certify this EIR tonight and approve this project, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, so next is um, Bill Coker, followed by Sam Nye. Good evening. Um, so glad to see that SoCal is at this point. Um, I'm very excited about you doing this. Um, this board was given years ago, and every board that's ever sat up here was given a water supply system that had no redundancy. It had one, pro one uh, source, and it was groundwater. And the diversification of water supply is hugely important. And uh, your general manager alluded to it earlier and said something to the effect that it may very well be that it's going to take a lot of different approaches to roll up a portfolio of water supply that is going to be reliable into the future. And so if just for that, you're going to diversify your water supply by 1,500 acre feet by 480 million gallons a year. And that's, that's huge for this district and congratulations. The other thing that I want to say is, um, in retirement, I, I went back for a couple years and I was the program manager for Pure Water Monterey. And we permitted that project, uh, actually I won't say with great ease, it was a lot of work, but it, we got, w when we went before the Regional Water Quality Control Board for a waste discharge permit, they were falling all over themselves saying, finally, finally we've got this project ahead of us in front of us and we get to approve it and they uh, meeting was over they came out and shook hands they love it we got a um, from the state water resources control board we had to get a drinking water permit and we did that with relative ease uh, despite the fact that i think in pure water monterey the sources are perhaps a little more challenged actually than, than the water that you're going to be using for your source water. So I can think of absolutely no reason that SoCal Creek wouldn't go forward with this. And, and I would suggest, as others have, that time is of the essence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coker. So next is Sam Nye, uh, followed by John Dickinson. My name is Sam Nye. Um, N-I-G-H, I live in Soquel. I own property uh, just down the street from the uh, Chanticleer intersection. And um, I'm here tonight because I just heard about this meeting uh, a couple of days ago. So I basically know, knew nothing about the project. Uh, when I was first told about it, I was definitely in favor of it. I thought it'd be a good use for that property, uh, which is right down the street. My property is on the corner of Madison Lane and, and Soquel, so it's uh, a block and a half down the street. But uh, after what I've heard tonight, um, I'm still uh, in favor of it. I think it's a, a good idea as a, a potential neighbor uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. So next is um, John Dickinson, followed by Pete Cartwright. Good evening, thank you for inviting us to this, make these comments. Um, in full disclosure, I should say I do volunteer work out of the projects at the, at the district, and I, uh, the, I know how hard these people work, both at the board and on the staff level. Um, I just wanna say that it, this is sort of 30,000 foot level stuff, but you know, the earth only has one supply of water. It's not gonna get any more. And it's our job as citizens of the world, citizens of Soquel, citizens of, in my case, Ladera Lane, to be stewards of that water. How do we use it? What do we do with it when we're done using it? And how do we recover it? You've never had a drop of water in your life, whoever you are, wherever you've lived on this earth, that was not recycled water. It's the only way it comes. 
It doesn't come from the sky. Well, the stuff that comes from the sky came from the ground before it got to the sky. It's really simple. So pure water Stokel is a way of giving nature a bit of a hand in recycling the water that would somehow otherwise get recycled. If the effluent goes into the ocean, the wave action vaporizes water. It goes up to the sky. It floats around the world. If we're lucky, we get some of it back in California. Most of it seems to go to the East Coast these days, but okay. But it's recycled water. And we're just saying, get it while you can. Put it back where it came from, and let's use it all over again. And meanwhile, take really, really good care of it, because it's all the water we're ever going to have. Thank you, and please go forward with this project. Thank you. Um, and then uh, the last speaker card I have is for Pete Cartwright. Well, thank you, uh, board members, and uh, thanks to Ron. I'm famous as the guy who's got a, a well that's had saltwater intrusion. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is there. I live in um, uh, uh, La Selva Beach. Uh, the property is on uh, San Andreas Road, and uh, my background has been in the, the power industry. Uh, I formed Calpine, and we built power plants across the United States in geothermal and natural gas. And I've been a resident over here for almost 20 years now, getting used to um, the importance of water uh, and the role it plays in, in our lives over here. Um, I'm an environmentalist. I was. Uh, a long-term member of the Sierra Club. I was on the board of directors of the uh, Sierra Club Foundation, and I'm very supportive. I've seen many, many uh, environmental uh, reports. I'm very proud of this one, and I'm very happy to support it. So thank you. Thank you. So um, at this point, um, that concludes all the speakers for which I have speaker cards. If there's anyone else in the audience who did not um, fill out a speaker card that wishes to address the board, now would be the time. Okay. So thank you all for your comments. We really appreciate that. Um, this will complete the public comment period. So um, we're going to take a little 15 minute recess to let everybody kind of stretch and maybe get a drink of water or something. And then so we will reconvene at. 8.10 or 8.11. <laughs> <laughs>
Leave it to Becky to hand them in after the break. Let me ask that again. I was surprised. I was surprised at the number. Then, like 21 to 4. I, you know, usually it's always the other way. Yeah, so uh, I can go get it. Um, talk to Michelle well, right now. She'll tell you, ask that question again. A lot of effort went into getting some of those people. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. It's not mine. If I'm, I wasn't quite as timely as I am with my students, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but at this time, I wanted to give um, staff the opportunity to, um, you know, before we turn to any discussion with the board, staff and the CEQA team opportunity to respond to any comments that were made during uh, the public comment period and um, make any final clarifications that we, that they be think is important for the board to consider. So, take it away. Thank you, President. Um, we wanna thank everyone for their very thoughtful comments. We wanna thank you also for staying within your time and also being such a polite audience. We very much appreciate it. Um, staff, legal counsel, as well as EIR consultants have considered all the comments that have been submitted tonight as well as the last few days. We believe that by and large those have already been previously addressed in the responses to comments and elsewhere in the administrative record. We did want to reiterate for the record that when reference documents have been cited by comment, commentors, either orally or in writing, staff, legal counsel, and EIR consultant have considered those reference documents. We have reviewed them and considered them in light of the EIR analysis. We believe that the EIR fully complies with CEQA and uh, the conclusions in the EIR are supported by substantial evidence. So with that, we are ready to take any questions from the board. All right, so are there any board members that have any questions or comments? Now is the time. Um, one of the questions I had was um, when we posted the draft EIR at various locations like the library, we left it there, right? So it's been there for how long? Since June 22nd. Okay, so there was plenty of time to review the multiple page document <laughs> and it wasn't just the last 10 days. I think that the that the when folks are referring to the 10 days they are for referring to the response to comments document and when that was made available and um, to repeat that sequel sequels the sequel requirements are that a lead agency provide uh, responses to comments submitted by public agencies at least 10 days prior to a certification hearing. And how many pages meeting. was that? And that is about the same size as the draft EIR because okay. um, it does include copies of all of the comment letters provided. Um, and and I, I covered this during our discussion earlier that 
the, that CEQA does not require that responses are provided to other commenters than, the, than, than um, public agencies. Um, however, the district did make that document available on their website and at the, at the, the district headquarters and did notify uh, commenters that it was available. And there's um, no required to respond to comments on comments? There is not. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I've, I had um, just concerns about the river transfer. I mean, I'm just going to tell you what I think. Is that okay, or do I need to you wait You can say later? whatever you like. Okay. Um, I had, um, I'd been, I worked for the County of Santa Cruz for a long time, over the 20 years, and one of the things that <laughs> I happened to be involved in was Davenport and their water rights or lack of actually um, documented water rights. And I also worked with the city of Santa Cruz quite a bit regarding the same kind of water right issue because with San Vicente Creek. And there is no simple answer when it comes to water rights. And it, you have no idea how long it was, will take to get it resolved and my understanding is that it takes decades and you never know when a decision is going to come out when it's new water rights when um, there already have been so it's not that i don't trust the city but i don't believe that it's that simple i know i heard that we had said that we didn't trust the city but i for one trust individuals at the city and i do um think that the river transfer is a lot harder than people realize and unless you've been in the business and tried to get water rights and understand every piece of it it's really hard to fathom how hard that is but I do know um, the sewer stuff I already resolved um, and grant funds my experience I have a lot of experience with grant funding and the reason it's called reimbursement isn't because they're not going to give you the money once you spend it. There's an agreement and they g agree to give you the m money that you spend and you have to document how you spent it, where it came from. It has to be exactly what the grant says they're paying for. And then after you spend it, you give them your receipts and you could give them the receipts before you pay the contractor back and you might get the money before you have to put out your own funds, but it's not a risky thing. I have actually managed at least four grant programs, actually more than that, because for two of the projects I had two grants and one of them had two grants in a loan, and I did them all at the same time, and it's not easy, but it's not risky as far as the money goes. Um, I would hope that we hire consultants that have professional opinions, that they, be, they basically risk their own professional um, credibility on and that they don't just give us what we want to hear. And it's not necessarily what I wanted to hear, what they wrote there. So I don't know why that question came up, but I don't agree with that. Um, I noticed that there's some people that were against desal and now are against this and i do have an issue with that you know it's like what you don't you don't live here and you don't want us to have water is what you're telling me because nothing we do is good enough it's sort of like when they told me i had to use plastic because paper wasn't what you should use and then they come back and say oh plastic's bad you got to use paper and that's how it is with this water you know what water source is the most environmentally perfect there's not going to be anything like that so um and lastly and i know that maybe this discussion is going to come i think at the next one so i will wait until the next part of this um, process for that one okay anyone else uh yeah i wanted to i just wanted to Re reinforce the energy consumption. There were a, a whole lot of uh, letters that were comments that were sent in about how uh, 
we were expanding the carbon footprint. We were, this is not as bad as a desal plant, but it was still a high energy intensive process compared, especially compared to water transfers. And I, I agree with uh, Mr. Duncan's first, uh, his opening statement, we we're comparing apples to apples, but I would still like to talk a little bit more about the energy consumption for the benefit of the audience and the customers. We have. Um, sure, that's fine. You want me to address that? So I do not believe the city of Santa Cruz has any uh, has done any uh, analysis on their energy consumption for their conceptual projects. Do, does um, no. I, no, they have not. I mean, so, according to staff. According to staff, because uh, we asked because we wanted to compare, so we have not seen any values or they haven't been shared um, with us. Uh, in general. Uh, well, and and part of the reason for that is because they're going to have they're upgrading their system. As you know, they have posted on their website they've detected um, uh, constituents from their uh, septic tanks uh, leaching into the river. So they want to upgrade it, and I applaud them for that their treatment system to uh, bring it to a better water quality. What they're serving their residents, and I think that's their plan. I think it's a good plan. So what that in, uh, what their new, uh, energy footprint looks like uh, when it's said and done, I don't know. In general, um, I, I know what they're looking at is carbon treatment and a few other things is, is generally doesn't take as much energy as uh, the purification process that uh, is proposed for Pure Water SoCal. Um, yes, please. I think one thing to note related to the overall energy footprint is to look at the purified water as a whole. So as we know, you know, the 25% of the treated effluent that's going out to the bay, the, the energy take it takes to get that water to that level to basically once one time use dispose of out to the ocean is about two thirds to three quarters of the full energy to take water from raw to purified. So for an extra 25% additional energy, you're creating a beneficial reuse. Instead of it just going out to the ocean, we add a little bit more energy, it becomes purified. And I think that's one of the things as we go forward um, with the project and as we continue to work and look at the water transfer project, the whole entire energy footprint of that project as well. It's not just to go and put the water into the ground. It's what Ron said. It's the treatment of it. It's the conveyance. It's going into the ground and then out. And just to reiterate, with Monterey community, community power, um, there will be no carbon footprint there. The energy uh, that we'll be using, would be using, um, is from green sources, uh, hydro, wind and solar All right anyone else or Bruce um, one thing I just want to mention is the caution and I, and I have another bigger thing that I wanted to go through <clears throat> uh, there's been a lot of talk by people about how much cheaper this transfer idea is uh, but I think a cautionary there is that there's this state law about prop 218 and it requires that if you sell water to one person for one price, you have to sell water to another person at the same price. You can't have someone get a you know, freebie or a whatever. And, uh, <clears throat> and that certainly holds, I think, with you know, our current situation. We do have water at a very attractive rate. In fact, it's so attractive that some of the North Coast water users are either, either already have or are th threatening to sue the city because they're paying a lot more than the district is paying. Now, the, the situation is, is, I think, defensible because it's only for the next two years and the water amount is limited, et cetera, et cetera, and it's, it's this pilot and experiment and so forth. But it means that once this two years is up, you know, the city is gonna look literally on you know, giving us water at anything less than the full commercial rate. So I don't see how people see that you know, even if the city wanted to give us water at a cheap rate, that the city even could, because they could very well get sued and lose and have to do it anyway. So that's something to be considered. <clears throat> the biggest thing I want to talk about, though, is I think some people are looking upon this as one side loses and the other side wins. And I don't think that's the case at all. I think this really is a win-win. Let me explain how I think that way. Look at a very serious drought year. Okay, 
And so we're taking water out for our customers. The city wants 1.2 billion gallons extra to make up the deficit for their customers. That's a lot of water going out of the basin. Because it's a drought year, there's not much rain and therefore not much recharge. If we get down below about half normal rainfall, we get zero recharge here. A lot of folks don't realize that. And of course, the city can't give us much river water because you know, there isn't much and they need it all and the fish need what's extra and so there's not much going in. So huge amounts going out, not much going in. And one has to wonder what that's gonna do to the basin. Is that gonna, is that gonna damage the basin? So I have some things if people wanna see it, some evidence, but let me just read one sentence that was printed at the last uh, um, MGA, the Mid-County Groundwater Agency meeting. And this came from the city. Some modeling results presented to the advisory committee indicated water levels in key monitoring wells dropping below protective elevations during periods of drought withdrawals. So in other words, that situation I just mentioned might damage the aquifer, which could mean that the only way to allow those withdrawals to happen by the city to go on is to have some water going in, and that's exactly what the pure water system would do. We would have water going into the basin, partly to offset all those withdrawals going out, and that might be the key difference to make the whole system work. Good point. Thank you, Bruce. Um, you, you're next. I'm next, I guess. I really don't have questions. I think okay. that the EIR was comprehensive, unbiased. Um, the staff, I think, gave accurate information to the consultants, and I think the consultants did a, an incredible job of, of evaluating the environmental impact. Um, I read it as a, a critically uh, to to look for bias, to look for things that were missed. And I didn't find them. So I think it's a solid EIR. And I wanna commend the, the staff and the consultants for producing a document that is, is so solid. I'm ready to make a motion. Let me just make one comment. Just, um, I'm, I, I, I agree with your point about diversification. And if I just had to boil down my whole feeling about this is that I, I've always tended to try and look way down the line and when we're all gone and when all the other people that are talking about this issue are gone in 30 years, I want to feel like we left them with the best possible situation where they have insurance against a drought and, and that our groundwater is protected. So. I think I honestly feel like after a lot of study by myself and everyone else uh, that this is the best way to to do that. So go for a motion. I would entertain a motion. I move that we adopt resolution 18-30 certifying the final environmental impact report EIR for the Pure Water Soquel Groundwater Replenishment and Seawater Intrusion Prevention Project. Okay. I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded. A roll call vote, please. Roll call. Director Lather? Yes. Director Daniels? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President LeHue? Yes. Um, so any, <laughs> any um, motions or comments on on the next step, which would be, you know, a motion to approve resolution 18-31, which just, includes. Do we need to have any discussion? Yeah, that? that's what I'm yeah. saying. This would yes. be a good time. So, to me, the most efficient siting for this plant is in Santa Cruz. The shortest distance to to the discharge, the shortest distance from tertiary water to advanced purified water, it just makes sense for me for it to be there. And I would like to encourage discussions with Santa Cruz about the mutual benefits of having the, the, the site there. 
So I'm not in support of, of Chanticleer as being the first site. And I'd like to see the language added that um, indicates that we will be having discussions with Santa Cruz. And if they're receptive, and again, I realize that the timing is, is not um, optimal for them with their process, the, you know, the WASAC process, but if they're receptive, I'd like to um, have it be strongly considered as the site for both the tertiary water and the advanced purified water. Bruce? Uh, I wonder if staff could tell us about the status of their opinions about this, if they have any, and, and where does that stand? Like, is it completely impossible, or is it possible, or is it, you know, they're ready to go, or you know, where, where do we stand? Thank you. Um, the staff has been working with the City of Santa Cruz Public Works Department and the staff specifically down at the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Facility. At this time, they do still stand um, in terms of their willingness and preference as stated in the comment that they provided into the draft EIR that they do prefer the tertiary treatment facility. The site there is pretty constrained. Um, they do also, you know, as part of the Water Supply Advisory Committee, are looking at recycled water still as a, a source for them. So I do see that there are some nexuses, like the Director Jaffe is saying, in terms of a mutual benefit. Um, their concern is the space constraints. Um, it is very tight. We had looked at that site multiple times. Originally in our first draft of the feasibility study that we did with Corolo, we had actually looked at relocation of their collection system and putting our facility down there and it be a single story. That was not something that they did, they wanted to entertain at all. And so as we continued to work with them, we actually came up with a proposal that was in the draft DIR of a, the full purification facility, but that it would be two story. One of the, the limitations on that is that if they do do go forward and they do pick uh, purification as, as their option, Again, it's a, it's a space constraint issue. Um, I, get, I think that Ron um, has been working with the city of Santa Cruz on, on that effort, and maybe you can speak to that. Well, yeah, I think Melanie s said it well. I mean, certainly we can explore it more. Um, the, we could, uh, you know, uh, take, you know, parallel approach or, or, or see, see what's available there. It's um, the recommendation from staff is for a reason, um, but you know, that's the board's prerogative. Can I add something? I, I think that I'm, I'm actually fine with having a, a very robust attempt to see if that would work, but also a time limited attempt because I wouldn't, because I have concerns about, you'd ha I'd have to have, honestly, an ironclad agreement within a few months that that site would be okay, it, you know, before I would want to just drag everything out and lose the possibility of getting a grant or, you know. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I agree that it, this shouldn't be dragged out, but in the, in the comments to the EIR, on page 3.4-4, and it's by Rosemary Menard, the water director for the city of Santa Cruz Water Department. It says the city, the city's, um, <clears throat> oh wait, there's an acronym there, RWFPS, recharge water, it's something, I'm sorry. Excuse me? Say it again. Their, their recycled water facility. Their water recycled <laughs> facility, okay, in, in their plan, concluded that supplying the district with treated wastewater from the city's wastewater treatment facility would not impede the city's effort in pursuing its own recycled water project pursuant to the WASAC recommendations. And the, but then they go on further. As the analysis of the pure water project continues, the city urges the district to continue to work with the city in understanding the opportunities of the shared resource. 
and to design and construct the project should it go forward with the other agency projects in consideration. And so that, to me, is the hope that the city would want to have it at their facility. So uh, can you clarify, I want to make sure we're clear that even yeah. by approving the project, we still have that option. We do. Yeah, and I actually, I may be wrong on this, I want to be clear, but I think that was in reference to tertiary treated water. Right. But uh, as I stated, um, you know, it's the board's prerogative of how, how we proceed forward, um, you know, which options we pursue with the most vigor. Can I add one more thing? Please. Just because I want to make sure, you know, a lot of the next steps will be dependent upon interagency agreements and land acquisition. Um, another point that the City of Santa Cruz staff had brought up to us was related to operator classification and permitting of the facility. I think their, their sentiment was um, we do wastewater and I think the treatment up to tertiary level is something that they currently do with their existing sand filtration and that they were they were interested in exploring and moving forward with the, ter the tertiary with membrane treatment. Um, I do think that some of the points that you're bringing up right now are things that we can explore. I think that was what the intent was of project approval was to set forth a path for staff to go forward and and get some additional better understanding of the engineering and the feasibility interagency agreements and these kinds of issues. So um, I think it may behoove us to potentially look at that for the city and Shanna Clear if that's something you want to do. But well, it sounds like you've already gone down that path. And But things have changed in the city recently. Just as there's climate change in the natural system, there's political climate change. And that's occurred in the city. And so I don't know what effect that will have. Um, I would just, just as we want to diversify so that we, you know, you don't put your eggs in one basket, I think the city is, a, is aware of this, the, the same philosophy and, and the, the value to that. So, and it, it can be very creative on, on how the agreement is, is, is written. If they want to, um, um, they want to elevate river water transfers, and it makes sense to do that. That could be part of the agreement of the siting. If they, and something that hasn't been uh, really explored to the level that needs to be explored is, is that getting water back to the city. I think we're at a point where if we do go through with, with this project, which I think we are going to go through with this project, that's going to open some doors and explore, allow us to explore offering water back. And we have models that can, can guide us in that. Bruce. I agree that we should look at the other possible things for collaboration. That's really good. We should do all that. You know, probably now that we've finished with an EIR, we can have a little bit of cycles to spend more on doing that kind of collaboration and discussing and so forth but I would not make any quid pro quos, like saying, okay, we'll only pursue, you know, aquifer storage and retrieval with you if you let us build our plant at your location. I think oh, that's I agree the, with you. That's the I agree thing. with you. I didn't mean to imply that. <clears throat> okay. Because we, we still need them as well for, you know, for our water supply too. So right. Right. We, we have to do this calmly and peacefully and friendly and... Yeah, it, I, it, it could be that the city, you know, at, after more more talks with them says no this is not where we want it but there's an efficiency with having it there right. there's also i think it does open up doors in the future for more collaboration well, I, I mean i think that we want to have those two sites be co-priorities for the short term i think that's fine it's, like i said as long as it doesn't delay anything well in my own mind i, I think the chanticleer site is is priority the other is a possible replacement of that, or, or a, 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 certainly a, mm -hmm. a runner with that, but it's, for me, it's still Chanticleer. And the other is very speculative right now. But I'm willing to say, you know, go and think about it, and look at it, and talk to them about it, see if they have an interest. 
Well, I think we really can't ignore the fact too that the, the Chanticleer site does is up upstream somewhat from the Brommer stormwater recharge area. It's, it looks like a very prime spot to recharge the aquifer that the belts well that they currently use in drought situations and is already been tainted with salt. So, I mean, the, it, every site that we've considered, it, it was still on the list in the EIR for good reasons, pro and, con, and and then there were problems with each one. And I think at some point, and we have to put a strict timeline on that, we will have to put our feet down and make that choice. And it may, now that we have a certified EIR, we perhaps this is a good time to go back and do a rigorous review of these sites. Okay. Um, so how would we change the resolution? We've drafted I don't a think we need to. something or just now. I mean, we've, can oh, you read okay. it? Sure. Do you want to, want to pull up the resolution uh, or should I just read it? Uh, just, read it. Okay. just read it. Okay. So this is on page 17 of 442. Further among the project options evaluated in the final EIR, the board shall prioritize project development and siting for tertiary treatment at the Santa Cruz wastewater treatment facility and the advanced water purification treatment at the Santa Clear site while also coordinating with the city of Santa Cruz on the potential site of the full water purification treatment um, at the Santa Cruz wastewater treatment facility and recharge wells at the Twin Lakes Church, Monterey Avenue, and Willowbrook Lane. I think I'd like to add one qualification to that, looking at the Santa Cruz site, which is as long as it doesn't slow up our progress. Well, so we look at it as long as we can, but we don't do that and risk any upset to our schedule. Um, would so how would like you, I don't know that that needs to be in the resolution, does it? Uh, could we put it in the motion when you approve the resolution that it's contingent we, upon? We could do a separate a motion about just that thing. Yeah. So approve this, you know, eight. What you just said with that adjustment. I um, I'm deferring to you, Michelle. <clears throat> it's really at the board's pleasure. You can change this resolution as you see fit. If you would like to add language to what Melanie indicated and say, <coughs> provided there's no delay to the project schedule. Sounds fine. Sounds fine. Okay. I'm Michelle, no? Uh, Tell us your concerns. My concern is I don't particularly like the Shannon Clear side. I have a problem with imposing our purification plant in someone else's neighborhood because the people in our neighborhood don't want it. And I just, I have an ethical issue maybe with the idea of doing that just because we have people here that don't want it at the site that is next to our um, facility. Um, I, it just, it bothers me. And the other thing is that site's been used as a construction staging area for probably 20 years and who knows what's there um, I would wonder if there's you know gasoline diesel you know who knows what's there riprap that would make it <coughs> difficult to do construction <coughs> my number one issue has always been from the beginning with that site that I didn't like forcing it on people that aren't even our constituents even though it's legal to do that and putting it, okay. and it, this is not an industrial facility. There's no <coughs> industry. It is just a purification facility that is just a few pieces of equipment pushing the water through, or you would call our district office and all of our pump stations um, industrial facilities and pretty soon nobody would have water because nobody want them because they say it's supposed to be it's an industrial facility I had a real issue with that being presented that way um, I I just you know and then so I would want if there was room at the city of Santa Cruz treatment plant that would be my first choice 
So is that language okay with the, so we're also considering that if as long as it doesn't delay the project? Excuse me, could, could staff, could we help, help out here and address? Um, I won't address your concerns or questions about one side or the other, but you did mention um, the potential for hazardous materials to be present at Chanticleer site given its past use. Um, just did want to to talk about a little bit about the hazardous materials analysis that was done in the ER. Um, we did do record searches of all of the project locations and nearby areas and didn't identify any known contaminants at that site or any other sites in, in or near the project areas. Um, that being said, uh, we still do find, did find a, less, a significant impact regarding potential to unearth or come into contact with unknown or unreported uh, hazardous materials. So the mitigation measures that are included in the ER have um, a number of safety measures to address any, consider, any consideration of potential you know, un unknown hazardous materials. Um, and I think in particular for, um, and this is going a little bit into you know, investigation, the investigations and, and planning efforts that would need to be undertaken for sites that are, that are new. Um, would include hazardous materials investigations on those sites, such as a phase one investigation. Um, that being said, yes, yes, there may be there may be you know gas and other materials at that site given its use, um, but there are measures and approaches to address that. Okay, Bruce, wouldn't we, as part of our purchase decision, do a due diligence examination of the site? I mean, I think that's a fairly standard thing, right? Wouldn't we know a lot Some of the borings? Surely, yeah. as, as we, we definitely we would. For that, mm -hmm. that would be part of the process. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, it might still have something on it. I mean, who who knows what's under right here? But uh, you know, it's uh, it, due diligence, and I think we could probably narrow it down to. Yeah. Well, I have up. I have less concerns about the, but what is that called? The the site next to the, um, the offices because that was all residential, mm -hmm. although there is that PG and E. Um, mm -hmm. Substation. Substation right there on the corner, so th there's always a potential. Um, the other part is that um, if we choose the Chanticleer side as our first, of our second priority, I'd like to still have the, the Soquel site as the third because I also, of course, you know, I've been wearing a lot of hats in my life, and I was in, I was in charge of the sanitation engineering, and as I recall, the um, Soquel Avenue has a lot of utilities in there. Um, and I had actually um, experienced, because it's right next to Caltrans, a project where we had a huge riprap that turned out to be asbestos. And it turned a somewhat simple project into a very difficult one. And um, so that alignment of the pipeline going to that site is another concern that I have as far as constructability, which has nothing to do with in environmental impact, but um, it's another reason I didn't like that site. Okay, so there's been kind of, a, there's a motion with uh, some adaptations to related to the Santa Cruz site. Anybody willing to make that motion? <coughs> can, can, can I read the motion? Yeah, yeah. please, okay. I was gonna ask for that. <coughs> Can we pull it up on the screen? You want to start there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, right. um, you pulling up the the motion or the resolution? The resolution. <laughs> well, that was it there, page seventeen. But the resolution, not the resolution, right? Or yeah, is it okay? Seventeen. It's seventeen. It's at the end of the resolution. I think. Sorry. Half seventeen, half. Yeah, it goes, yeah, it's actually at the top of 18, mostly. You want me to start here? Top of page 18. Oops, sorry. It's going crazy. Okay, okay. And I'm gonna go down. Okay, so where it says, now therefore, be it further resolved that the board approves the following. Approval of the project as described in the final EIR consisting of these components, water treatment facilities at one or two sites a pipeline alignment for secondary or tertiary effluent, a pipeline alignment for purified water, 
a pipeline alignment for brine concentrate and recharge wells and appurtenances at up to three sites from the components evaluated in the final EIR. Further, among the projects project options evaluated in the final EIR, the board shall prioritize project development and siting for tertiary treatment at the Santa Cruz wastewater treatment facility and the advanced water purification treatment at the Chanticleer site, while also coordinating with the city of Santa Cruz on the potential to site the full advanced water purification treatment at the Santa Cruz wastewater treatment facility provided no delay occurs to project schedule, and recharge wells at Twin Lakes Church, Monterey Avenue, and Willowbrook Lane. And the remaining, okay. the remainder of the motion, of the resolution stays the same. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. The motion for the resolution with those edits. With those edits, additions. I'll, I'll make that motion. Okay. I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded. Um, roll call, please. Director Lather? No. Director Daniels? Uh, yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President LeHue? Yes. <coughs> Motion carries. Rochelle, I, did you want to comment on your no vote? Or, because I, my, I think you've made it, you made it clear that I'm very, I'm very happy about the indirect potable reuse project. I just have very strong feelings about where we locate the purification um, site, and I'm not, in all good conscience, I just couldn't vote for that. Okay, but you, are you okay with if it's at Santa Cruz? If the yes, Santa Cruz would be great. Okay, then I'd be happy. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm gonna. We are going to move on to the next agenda item. So thank you very much, everyone. I don't. We we'll give a. How about a five-minute recess for people to allow you to clear out? I just want you to help. Got some food. Maybe I need another. Consent agenda now. Um, are there any board members that wish to pull anything off of the consent? The I would like to pull 3.8, please. 3.8. Okay. That's the standing committee assignments. Correct. The uh, minutes when I wasn't here. Um, that would be which one? Uh, sit in the middle. 3.13. One. 3.13. Okay. Anything else? Any members of the public wish anything pulled off of consent? I'm left handed on this thing, so. so if you could pull up 3.8 and. 3.8 and 3.1 3.3. 3. <coughs> and yes, Becky, did you do have something you wanted to pull off consent? I, I have an issue with uh, item 3.12. I think there are some errors. Okay. okay. We'll pull that one off too. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'll entertain a motion for approval of the remaining items. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah, Those? Three point one, which one first? Uh, All right, so minutes. Um, we have 3.1.2. That was a, that Becky, that was your question. So you want to let us know what? Sorry, I didn't get a lot of sleep last night trying to read Tell this. Tell us about it. Three point, okay, 140, page 144 of the agenda is where that, the, the meeting minutes start. Thank you. Reading 720 pages and then a 400 plus page, 442 page, I mean, that's a yes. cruel and unusual punishment. Yeah, I agree, and it would have been nice to have more time to do so. 
So uh, on those minutes there. Um, I'm sorry. I, I'm really tired and I just can't think. So um, we could go on with the other things and come back could to you it. for a minute and let me just gather my thoughts mm -hmm. here. I didn't think I was going to be up first. Thank you. OK, um, Bruce, you had I think it was just that you were I wasn't here, so I can't vote on that. OK, so I move those agenda. You move approval of the minutes? Yep. Okay. That minutes. For that Great particular December minutes 4th. for seconded. December 4th? Yep. I'll second it. Moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 And? And I recuse myself because I wasn't okay. here. I All right. Abstain. I abstain. Abstain. abstain so. On abstention. And then do you want to go on to item 3.8? I do. So I am on two of these, and I would like to offer them to anyone else on the board who would like particularly you know, some of the newer members who would like more experience. If you want any of those seats, feel free. I would like to stay on the MGA because I think this is going to be the critical year, but uh, anything else I can give up. Any interest? Any interest? Yeah, I am. Okay. I think I'm, an, I'm just an but I'm on a lot of committees too. Think all You're on them all. On You're on them all, so you can't be t on both. I can't be. On, well, I'm just an alternate on the. A water resources, right? So on water resources, we could switch. You could switch, yeah. Okay. Okay, so she takes water resources, and I'm the alternate. Okay. okay. So all the, do we have to make a motion? Oh, it says information it's only. On the finance. The well. Floor. Yeah, Bob. How do we? This was an informational item because they were two two year two year uh, selections, but they want to change it up. Uh, we have to, we could bring it back. Bring it back. Bring it back. All right, we'll bring it back for official an action item. item. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I didn't so, realize. so that item remains not, um, you know, no. Well, it was just information, so it doesn't matter. We'll come back with it on the consent item with the motion that you or oh, okay. what you're indicating. Okay. Okay. And what did we just say? And. So, we're back to the meeting minutes that you had a question about, Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you. I, I circled it. I didn't make a note why I circled it, but I seem to remember that um, what I would like to see in these minutes is um, what the public comment is. When there are members of the public that come, um, those, those meetings are in the middle of the day, oftentimes. I mean, I know I have taken time off work to attend. It would be nice to have a more clear uh, report of what it is that a member of the public who attended a committee meeting had to say. I, I believe that was my main concern. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, I'll entertain a motion to approve those minutes um, from November 20th. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. And we will move on to oral communications for items not on tonight's agenda. Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. I would like to thank you for moving forward with the water transfer pilot project. I would like to um, thank you for doing the very careful analysis of any possible chemical problems with surface and groundwater. It has lent a very good level of confidence that you are being careful and uh, preserving public health, and I want to thank you for doing that. I would like to ask you to please begin now um, working with the City of Santa Cruz to ask for a three-year extension of that MOU for this uh, pilot project because it has taken you three years to get to this point, doing your due diligence. And um, I think it's only fair to make full use of a five-year agreement of a research project for which you are getting a a very good rate on the water, but to um, to really give it a fair chance in a variety of rainwater years to give it a full study. Two years 
is really not enough. So I would like to ask you to please, while you're making your very concerted efforts to work with Santa Cruz City and get the Pure Water Project treatment plant in their grounds, that you also make very diligent efforts to ask for an extension of the uh, water transfer project pilots. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Is there anyone else? Any board members? By this time, um, usually we've had over eight inches of rain, and what we've got is less than three and a half inches. So we are way below 50% right now. So the, the D word definitely comes to mind in, in the situation. So. Right, and I don't think there's any on, well, little on the horizon. And I don't mind asking the city for more extension for this, but given that they're already being sued for doing this already, I think the likelihood is zero because that would set them up to, to get sued and lost. Okay, anyone else? Okay, we will then move to the organization-wide status report. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, please, Shelley. We may be missing one or two, maybe Melanie, uh, but we can answer any questions. Um, I don't have anything else to add to the Conservation Customer Service field report, but if you had any questions about those items, okay. You first. Yep. The fourth bullet, participated in discussions with the county and the state about grant funding and what kind of progress, if any, what kind of opinion did you get from that? So no, that's that grant that they yeah. offered us for um, uh, verification of the dual EM work that we did, and that's still on the table. And so the county is, um, Sierra Ryan has agreed to kind of take the lead on that project <clears throat> and move forward with it. And she's drafted a request for proposal for a consultant to uh, do some borings at the um, the sites at the Seascape Golf Course, as well as the county site at Bromer and 30, uh, 38th that they're looking at, mm -hmm. and perk tests. And so we'll see how those bids come in. Hopefully they'll be $35,000 or less, and they'll be fully covered by that grant funding that the state's uh, giving for the project. So um, we'll be keeping you posted about that, how those bids come in. Um, and you know, if they're over thirty-five thousand dollars, then of course we'd be coming back to the board and asking how you want us to proceed. Thank you. Is thirty-five thousand what the grant is? Yes. And I just wanted to say, great on the way where you found to give our rainwater catchment system to Cabrillo. That's yeah, an awesome, that really worked awesome out well. way for that to get utilized. And then I don't know who I can ask this. Maybe it's Emma. When I, when I try to highlight things on this report, it wants to highlight five lines at a time. So there's some formatting problem. <laughs> okay. We've ran into that before. We, we just, I need a, when we do it, we need to check that. So uh, sorry, that's about five lines, yeah. Also on the, the recharge um, project, so we've been checking in with the Seascape Golf Course general manager oh, yeah. and um, the property sale was supposed to happen at the end of uh, November and that didn't occur and so we just checked back in with him again and he thought it was going to close at the like, end of December. Um, yeah, pretty soon and so we're trying to kind of get on their meeting schedule so that we can come in and talk to them because we need their participation to obviously move forward with uh, the borings and perk tests. So, right. yeah, yeah I, I talked to them too. Okay. And um, it's my understanding that the new owners are completely for the Great. project. They just yeah, can't do people. anything about it. Yeah, they're local people. They want to do something that helps the community and the golf course. That's good. Great. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. And then we had engineering. And then we're going right to owner. Or I'm right over here, but I, I don't. There you are. <laughs> I could talk to these, but it's been a long night. If there's any questions, you know, I maybe highlight that uh, Amanda Bunty, who is was our district's water sampling technician, has applied and and been um, 
selected for our engineering technician. So I'm excited, and you know, and our department is for her, and and uh, now Christine has to recruit someone for that position. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Tosh. Any any questions? Uh, first bullet is probably the biggest um, you know thing to discuss that we are shooting to start that grant funded uh, pilot rat recharge well next month early. Great. Okay. Um, I don't think I have anything to add. I do want to announce that Troy Adams is here and he is going to replace John Henderson as our operations supervisor. Oh. So mm -hmm. he starts on uh, Welcome. Thursday. Yeah. Um, and he comes from the city of Scotts Valley. He's a wastewater division manager there. And huh? before ah. that, he worked for <laughs> Scotts Valley Water District as the operations supervisor. So mm -hmm. I think I've run into Troy before with my students. Exactly. So Great. Do you have any questions? I can answer those. Well, uh, anybody? We're good. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. So our special projects person is yeah. how'd you dig it out yeah yeah I, uh, yeah probably <laughs> exhausted um, a lot going on as usual though but um, it's there for the reading or I can answer any questions if you if you like oh, I think we're good mm -hmm. right? yeah anything on finance so just to let you know we're finalizing the Wait, you uh, popped up over there uh, now. yeah we're just all <laughs> popping up over here. Um, we're finalizing the administrative record on the uh, rate study and we hope to have it uh, available on the website by the end of the month. And the Prop 218 notice is on track to be sent to the printers on Thursday. Great. And Tracy, um, I didn't know where you were going to pop up. <laughs> <laughs> I could be anywhere. I could be sitting there, but I'm glad I'm not. Um, we uh, obviously we've been very busy recruiting, um, and um, as our other managers have mentioned, um, we have finalized some really great candidates and are excited about folks coming on board and promoting our own. Um, I don't have anything more to add unless you have any questions. No questions, it looks like. So thank you very much. Keep up the good work. Um, we got a great staff, so it's, I'm sure people want to come here. Um, and Ron? Yeah, I'll just highlight one thing. I mean, there's some the single the, use one. The single <laughs> use. It seems appropriate tonight. So uh, every year they come out with the uh, the word of the year, the new word uh, that's catching people's attention and is most often cited. And uh, the Collins Dictionary uh, cited single use uh, in, in the sense of a negative thing, that is the way it's being used, because the single use of plastic, single use of uh, water, that sort of thing. So. I was happy to highlight that. Okay. Um, anyone looking like no questions there? So, any questions? I think that's the whole status update. Yes, it is. So, any questions from the public on the status update or comments? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner from Aptos. I have a question on the engineering report. Um, will the granite way well as it is developed be tested, um, especially at groundwater level and, and a little bit higher for any plumes of contamination? There still uh, remains a very real possibility of contamination um, that looks like it could even fit a profile of bunker sea oil. Those um, contaminants as they break down become more carcinogenic rather than less. So I really want to make sure that that is kept on your radar as you do that work at the Granite Way well. I also have a question about um, the staff coordinating non-district projects. Uh, what are the county improvements in Aptos that you would be coordinating? And um, are the Aptos Village plan, I, I assume that means project, uh, is that phase two that you're, that you're looking at there? Thank you. Thank you. Well, we um, always monitor our water to meet uh, the requirements necessary. Right. And I, 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 I understand that. And there's a seal, and <coughs> most of the contaminants are much closer to the surface. And if you don't DDW, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a legal requirement, and we 
Yeah, we're proactive. All right, District Council. I don't have anything to add. The cases we've been watching are still out there pending, and I don't expect to see any decisions for at least two months. Okay. Thank you. And Mid County Groundwater Agency update. Yeah, uh, just in case any of the board members wanted to, to talk about it, we, we continue to uh, chug along. Um, uh, I, they, I'll just, they, as a one comment, and just that, you know, since I'm on the MTA as well, I think, and as, as the plan is developed, if it gets to, you know, having a project that would recharge the mm -hmm. mid county groundwater basin is, could become an important element to the sustainability plan. Yeah, and that's, I'm glad you brought that up because the MJ board did write a um, kind of a little paper and shared it with the GSP advisory committee, groundwater sustainability plan advisory committee. And basically what it did is say, look, uh, we want you to work within these, these guardrails, if you will, and uh, as far as projects go. And so what they say in that letter is, we want uh, pure water Soquel and the river waters transfer, uh, and they call those out specifically included in the plan, mm -hmm. and really everything, but they, they did make a point of calling those two projects out right. um, specifically. Okay. Um, I think the next meeting is January 17th or right around there. Something like that, yeah. yeah. So, um, all right, um, next would be Conditional and unconditional will serve letters. Yes, we have four for the board to consider. A couple, uh, I think there's three single family homes and one accessory dwelling unit. They have all met their water demand offset requirements. Any questions? Questions? Okay, any questions from the public on this one or comments? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. So I have a question. When you say they've met the water demand offset requirements, is this now under the um, the big C of what is um, now being considered the available water demand offset credits being offered by the smart meter installations? Or um, I'm just a little confused because the policy has changed so much. What does it exactly mean when they have met the water demand offset credit requirements? Thank you. I can just answer that because it varies depending on whether they're with the, yeah. the, the, the new program or whether they're continuing with the old one. It could have still been, I didn't look, I don't remember specifically on these whether they were replacing toilets or I think that's what most of these were. Yeah, many of them were uh, replacing toilets. Uh, that's part of it. I'm not sure specifically, but and then also uh, contributing to the fund that uh, is projected to, the project proje projected to save, I think, about 80-something acre-feet, so that'd be correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, any motions coming along? Actually, I, had, I just had a question about the, just a, it's just a, not related to anything, but the 329 Cherry and the 322 Capitola, are they the same spot? No. They aren't there adjoining each other? Mm -hmm. in the same? No. It was in the same. The, the Capitola one is up next to the library? Or near? No, it's. No, it's Capitola it's, Avenue is down It's there. close, oh. but one is on Cherry at the corner, and the other one is um, I was thinking it's on Capitola Avenue, just past the trestle. Uh, it, same uh, owner or developer. I think that's the common yeah. theme. That's not a, it's not a typo. Okay. <laughs> a unique name, too, for the developer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. so that, was, that was just an incidental question. So I'll, if we have a motion, I'll second it. Um, no one's made a motion yet. Okay, I'll make a motion. For all four? All four. I'll second it. Okay. You get those, Emma? Okay, all right. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I posed. Can I ask you a question about that? Sure. Are you going to oppose? We've approved mm -hmm. a new program. Mm -hmm. Are you going to continue to oppose everyone? 
I, as I said, uh, one, one of the reasons, and I'm still about that, is that uh, people still don't know that we have these offsets. I know that big, huge project in, in Aptos, we had a sign that was about that big. All the constructors, I mean, one sign was six feet wide and 10 feet tall, we had a sign like that. And unfortunately, they put it on the gate, so when they showed up in the morning, they moved the gate out, <laughs> and the sign was backwards. And I mean, this so happens all the time. So the main thing is you want to have it said, this much water is being saved at Well, just this big enough to, to actually be seen by people and people understand okay. it. And, and we, we're, start, we're just kind of going through the motions. Okay. And there doesn't seem to be any. So you want some public outreach related to these? I want people to know right. that we're taking care of this, that it's not just, okay. oh, my water's being stolen by that. Well, I'm glad I asked stuff. because, I mean, I think mm -hmm. I, maybe even staff forgets that that's one of the reasons for okay. that. So, yes. so because I think. I, I bet you Becca. I, I, I bet you Becca could make some amazing signs. <laughs> She's so, pretty good at that. So I'd, I'd be open to agendizing a discussion of the yeah. signage. Okay, let's do okay. that for, yeah. w, for WDO no, projects. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And maybe even sure a mock-up. Be sure and invite Becca to the meeting. Now. Yeah. All right. Well, well, she'll be on it. <laughs> okay. I'm glad I asked. Okay. Yeah. I assume something else. Okay, so um, item 6.2, um, this is how much the, uh, consider compensation for directors uh, according to the ordinance. Um, good evening. Um, on an annual basis, the board takes uh, the compensation for um, work done under board activities. Um, in consideration, our local ordinance 1501 dictates the uh, amount um, that the board considers annually in compliance with um, section as identified in the memo, section 20202 of Division 10 of the California Water Code. Um, in accordance with both of those um, rulings, any adjustment cannot exceed 5% per year of the original adopted compensation amount, which um, is equated to $100, plus any unused adjustment from previous years. So um, in, uh, as attachment number one to the memo um, has a long-term history of the board's compensation and changes to that compensation and showing a cumulative percentage available for the board to consider if they are considering changes to their compensation. Um, for purposes of the record, the current uh, 2018 board member compensation is listed at $160 per day for each day's attendance at regular meetings of the board, at standing committee meetings, and for each uh, day's service rendered that involves out of town travel. And there's also an $80 per day for authorized service within Santa Cruz County with a maximum total um, per day of $160, not to exceed $160. So the um, information presented to you tonight is to consider whether or not the board is interested in making any changes to its current compensation, which was last altered about 10 years ago, 11 years ago in 2007-08. Uh, Probably not worth the same amount anymore, is it? <laughs> Mr. President. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to talk to Tracy about this and I looked at the numbers. There is a dispute statewide on what that statute means. And I think the more conservative approach is it's $5 a year. That's It's based on the $100, yes. not based on what the previous amount is. It still makes a difference between what you're getting and about $230 instead of that percentage being applied retroactively. Okay, with 11 years. Well, I think, it, it, uh, I think I, Tracy took Five dollars a year, so we we didn't say compound it in any way, correct? Tracy? Oh, it starts at ninety-two, doesn't it? Ninety-two, ninety-three. If you take that from how many years is that? From the from the nineteen ninety-two, ninety-three fiscal year is what you're right. talking about. Um, yeah, that that's. So I guess ma what I'm not understanding is the dispute that's out there. I don't think it's a dispute. It's just a question of how it's calculated. I don't think we're going to get anywhere close that's to the range that you're okay. talking about. Yeah. So why don't y'all talk about it? Go outside and talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Let's, let's, we're let's, tired. Let's, <laughs> okay. Oh. Yeah. Yes, Bruce. I'm. It's public service. It's nice getting compensated, so I can tell my wife why I'm doing all this. It's not much per hour, I know. Yeah. <laughs> we could do it on the basis of ten, like ten cents a page. <laughs> be a big, it'd be a big amount That'd this be better. but but uh, I'd like to make the motion that we keep it at one at the same levels that it is now. Okay. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. That wasn't difficult. We didn't go over the five percent thing. Okay. Or five dollars. Or either one. <laughs> I had a feeling that's where we'd be. Okay, um, now for the patient, Leslie and, <laughs> and consultant. <laughs> Sorry about the late hour, but <laughs> here we are. So tonight, um, I, I do want to acknowledge right off the bat here that Ryan Kinney, our supervising accountant, has put a tremendous amount of work into our financial statements and working with our auditors. Um, I did text Ryan a picture this evening of the crowd that had assembled for our meeting, <laughs> and his response was, wow, I'm guessing they're all interested in the financial <laughs> statements. <laughs> I'm sure. Does, does he get cam combat Make pay for... Now, <laughs> <laughs> I can and hear the crickets out there right now. <laughs> We're expecting a 45-minute detailed report right now. 50. No. Okay. no. So tonight, um, we are presenting <laughs> our um, comprehensive annual financial report for 2017-18. In addition, we've coupled, the, uh, uh, coupled with this memo um, the capital facilities reserve because in 2017, we did adopt a capital facilities reserve and part of the funding for that was reserve was an allocation from unre unrestricted net position, gain in unrestricted net position. So since the, we were presenting that number to you tonight, it just seemed logical to go ahead and have you decide at this time what, if any, you wanted to allocate toward the reserve. Great. So tonight we have um, Mr. Chris Brown from FEDAC and Brown. He's a, uh, our audit partner and he's here tonight to present our, um, our financial statements. And actually, he has a presentation. Oh, is it in the attachment too? Um, it should be right on the desk. But not super long, right? <laughs> it's pretty quick. It's yeah, pretty quick. Good. As long as we're smart <laughs> enough to understand, quick. right? <laughs> we got a long ways to go. No. No. Yeah, that sure. Was, yeah. That was my supplemental. Yeah. I guess. Oh, it's, it's, um, it's, no. it's the one over there. there. No. This one on the right. I think that's it. Pictures of my family in uh, Yellowstone. Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay, uh, once again, my name is Chris Brown, a partner with FEDAC and Brown. I want to go over the results of the 2018 audit. Go ahead and go to the next one. i uh, just like to let you know that the audit was performed in accordance with the auditing standards generally accepted in the United States of America. Those are the standards that the auditor must uh, follow when performing an audit itself. So. Uh, the audit procedures, uh, they also include assessing the district's internal controls. We're looking at how you do things. We're testing certain transactions, certain cycles. From that, uh, we design our uh, audit programs and such. Coming into our final field work, which is after your year end, we're agreeing the balances to the supporting documentation and performing analysis of the key relationships between the, uh, the various financial statements. Okay. There are two documents that are uh, published, um, the CAFR, Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, and the Management Report. Within the CAFR itself is the auditor's opinion, and you can see our opinion here. Um, it's, we're providing an unmodified opinion. Uh, in essence, in our opinion, the financial statements yeah, yeah, yeah. referred to above present fairly in all material respects the financial position of the Selkill Creek Water District as of June 30th, 2018. So congratulations, it's an unmodified opinion. Mm -hmm. The other document that I, or I uh, referred to was the management report, and that is the auditor's communication to you, those charged with governance. You're my boss, okay? This report goes to you. And within that report, we would document any issues that we might have come across, any journal entries that were recorded to the original trial balance as provided to us. And I'm happy to say that we did not identify any material weaknesses within the district's internal <coughs> structure itself. So there again, congratulations. Good. I didn't doubt it. No. So good to see. Hold on. Okay. I'm going to have to kind of 
look off of this and use my cheat sheet because I can't really see that too well. Mm -hmm. What we have here is the condensed statements and net position, and I won't go into this a lot of detail, but what this is, there again, it's condensed, and it's aggregating your assets and liabilities and net position, uh, multiple accounts grouped together. You can see current assets, one of those line items. It's going to be multiple accounts all pulled together that fit within that uh, within the current asset category but basically big picture is that we can see total assets where and i'm going to kind of i'm going to go ahead and uh, round these a little bit total assets were 97.5 million which was up uh, 3.787 million from the prior year we can see deferred outflows of resources was 3.4 million real quick what that relates to are amounts that will be applied to your Primarily, okay, there's there's some other aspects of that number that don't apply to this, but the vast majority of that amount there will be applied to your uh, pension liability and your OPEB liability, which is your other employee benefit. That will be applied to that in the next year. Okay. With regard to the liabilities, you can see it's 48 million or 48.7 million, which is up uh, 615,000 from the prior year. Deferred inflows, kind of the opposite. These amounts won't be applied necessarily to uh, your pension or OPEB. Most of these amounts will be expensed in the next year. Okay, so and these aren't amounts you can really affect you know, on your deferred inflows and outflows. Uh, net position, that's essentially your net worth. That's your assets minus your liabilities. What's left over? Okay, it doesn't represent cash necessarily. It's what's left over, and it is broken up into three different areas what you've invested in your capital assets, less any debt on purchasing those assets, and any accumulated depreciation. Uh, restricted, uh, that represents amounts that are uh, set aside for capital improvements or debt repayment, okay? And unrestricted, this is a number that I watch pretty closely, especially when I'm doing a, a long-term trend uh, of a client. Um, we can see that uh, unrestricted net position was 9.347 million, which was up 2.3 from the prior year. So positive move in that area. Okay. Why are current liabilities increased? Why are current liabilities increased? Yeah. I will have I mean, we to haven't gone out for loans or anything, have we? So Let me take a stab at this, or do you... I'm not quite sure if it's the cash position or if it's the receivable position. I can look at that. So most of our current liabilities are, are money. I'm sorry, did you we... say liabilities or assets? I'm sorry. Liabilities. liabilities. Oh, I'm sorry. That's I'm what sorry. we owe in terms of accounts payable. It's yes. our payroll, uh, crew payroll payable. Okay. okay. Um, all of that type of thing. Yeah. Uh -huh. So if we've got some large, uh, at the end of the fiscal year, if we've accrued payables for some large construction contracts that haven't been Pay expensed off yet, yet yeah, okay. then it would sit out there on our current library. So that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I had assets in my mind when you said that, so thank you very much. Okay, go ahead and go to the next one there. Okay, this is the condensed statements of revenues, expenses, and changes in that position. It's your profit and loss statement, essentially. Looking at the 2018 column, we can, about right in the middle, there's a line item that says change in net position. That's essentially your net income, okay? And we can see that it was uh, 4.088 million, okay? What makes up that change in net position is essentially your revenues minus your expenses. Revenues for 2018 were uh, 19,060,000, which was up 2.77 million from the prior year. Uh, you can see in operating revenues, the very top line there, it actually increased 2.6 million from the prior year, essentially greater water sales, uh, you know, consumption, and rates going into that. Okay. Non-operating revenues, the line item down, uh, my cheat sheet says uh, increased by 166,000, primarily due to increase of 175 in interest earnings, which is consistent with our other clients. Uh, interest rates are going up, so return on your assets invested in lay for uh, CDs and CalTrust and such are higher. Okay. Moving our way down to the expenses category, uh, we can see total expenses were 16 million approximately, up 1.5 million from the prior year. Of the operating expenses, we can see it increased by approximately uh, 1.4 million 
primarily due to an increase of 594,000 in source of supply. So you were selling more water, okay, and uh, cost of water. Uh, so source of supply was higher, and an increase of 587,000 in general and administrative costs as well. Okay. Uh, the next item, non-operating expenses, actually decreased. It was a minor amount, approximately <coughs> 27000 from the prior year. Working our way down, we see capital contributions, those amounts that either come from grants or from uh, development fees and such. We can see it increased by approximately 50000 There again, the sum of it all, doing the math, we see that the change in net position or your net income, if you want to look at it that way, was that 4,088,000. Net position at the end of the period was 51,629,995. So kind of big picture, just kind of going back over the whole process. Um, the auto went very well, and the manager who was on the engagement, Mr. Abadesco, wishes to uh, you know, send his appreciation and thanks to everybody that helped out, uh, Leslie and Ryan, they did a great job. Okay, and everybody else that was involved. Our review of your internal controls, we did not come across any items that we consider to be a material weakness. And there again, we see positive results and an increase in your unrestricted net position for the year. So it went very well from our side. Do you have any questions? I am not surprised that it's been done well. I would be surprised otherwise. Yes. Yes. No. Good. Any any questions from the board? Um, I will. We have an item to discuss too, but I wanted to see Thank if there's any members of the public Thank that you, had Mr. any. Brown. Thank you very much. Any public comment on this item? Thank you for this good information. Um, this is Becky Steinbrenner from Aptos. I have a question on uh, the discussion about total revenues on page. 310, it talks about um, how the, uh, compared to the prior year, the volume of water sold was 240 acre feet per year more than was sold in 2017. So I want to ask you how effective do you think your water demand offset program really is? If these people that you're giving new water service to are supposedly meeting the water demand offset requirements, and yet the amount of water that you're, <clears throat> that's being used in your district is up 240 acre feet. How effective is the water demand offset program? I also want to ask a question. Um, and maybe just some clarification, because I don't understand what this is saying. In the fiscal year 2017, the district's total revenues increased 3.05% or $481,329, mainly due to a $747,772 combined increase in water sales and service charge revenue that was offset by not having a comparable recognition of water demand offset credit revenue that occurred in the fiscal year 2016. That makes no sense to me. And I'd like an explanation of that. The fees, the water demand offset fees, are recorded as a liability until they are used on a project that creates water savings. And once the project is complete, these fees are recognized as revenue. How uh, will that work when you use the smart meters as your water to, as your uh, water savings projects, how are you going to record that? Um, and then um, finally, I had a question on page three fifteen about the water capacity fees between two thousand seventeen and two thousand eighteen. They're huge difference. Two thousand seventeen is about eighty four thousand dollars. 2018 is almost $765,000. So I'd like um, an explanation of that, please. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Okay. You want me yeah. to address the overarching question about the uh, WDO? Just let it go. Well, I mean, I think it's okay. so, uh, obvious. Personally, 
Yeah. Okay. The water demand offset program is a very tiny bit of our overall water sales, and I think just people are using more water. Um, unfortunately, that's been the trend yeah. in the last couple. It's not just our district; that's over the whole state. The whole state's seen a much greater rebound, uh, and so I think it proves our customers are con continue to try to conserve um, and doing a good job. And the the water demand offset program is effective. But I also think it shows. Uh, it illustrates the need for uh, supplemental water supply. Things are bouncing back even more, you know. So, um, well, and let's do one of those water demand offsets and supplemental supply things. Um, <laughs> if there's further questions, maybe um, to, you could come to the office and ask one of the staff. Mm -hmm. Probably not for this meeting. Um, and there, are any questions from the board or? ideas about how much you would like to put into, we, we have to accept the report and we also have to decide if we want to put some into the capital facilities reserve, right? I'll, I'll move we accept the report. That's second. Okay. I second. Moved and seconded to accept the report. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And motion number two would be direct staff. So just to provide some context, we have about 2.2 million right now in the capital facilities reserved. Taj is lobbying for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, right now there's about 2.2 million in there. What's available for you to allocate this year would be an additional 2.3 million. Um, over the next two years, we have about 8 million in PAYGO capital projects that would qualify for funding from the capital facilities reserve. Yes, Bruce. I'm wondering, rather than stick this in a reserve fund where we're getting, you know, practically zero interest, if we could use some of this at least for, you know, more prepaying of the OPEB, which actually saves us real money. That's that's an op that's an option. We can certainly pay down some of those mm -hmm. pension and my um, pension and OPEB liabilities. Okay. Um, I had a question about that a whole like tier thing. Can, I mean, you know, it, where we lost income because we had to go back and, hmm. right. it, is that going to be in the next? No, that was, oh yeah, I'm sorry, that yeah. will be in the next one. This, yeah. this is for the uh, period into June 30th, 2018, mm -hmm. and so the lawsuit ramifications were Started July it. and August okay. of 2018. Those will be reflected on the next financial statements. Yeah, so that'll be interesting to see. So do you, as how it affects uh, us. do you have a recommendation yeah, on how much to put in? <laughs> well, I mean, I just, I just wanted to let you know that if you were to allocate funds, additional funds to that capital facilities reserve, it looks like there are plenty of capital facilities projects in the CIP plan that would qualify for funding from that reserve. So it wouldn't sit there unused. How many projects can you do in a year? Um, well, we have the Sorry. Soap Hill Drive cast iron main replacement that would be a pretty large project. Yeah. And we've had some leaks and mm -hmm. holes there, yeah. I'll entertain a motion. I would put it all in capital facilities reserve. Yeah, that might actually end up saving water and money in the long run. That's true. So. I'll second it. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you. Let's spend it wisely. <laughs> oh yeah, well I mean, I think we do have lots to still take care of for sure. I'll hate driving to Cabrillo and seeing the water spurting out of the road. Yeah. Okay, so um, next is the Bid awards for um, 6.4 is the Twin Lakes Church Seawater Intrusion Prevention Pilot Well Project Bid Award. Well, I'm pleased to bring uh, four bids to the district. Um, our en engineer's estimate doesn't qualify as a bid, but we were right in the middle of all those bids. Mm -hmm. Good job. Um, yeah. Yeah. Majora Brothers is a local company that has drilled several of the district's wells. Uh, they are um, qualified to perform this work. They did fail to submit a few of the documents that we were 
we had asked for in the bid document, so it does require that you, the board uh, waive those minor irregularities. Uh, they did subsequently submit those those documents. So like the next day, wasn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, further, the the uh, experience modification rate uh, relating to their safety rating um, was explained, and that, that's an attachment that um, I can dive into if you wish. But otherwise, it's so it wasn't the drilling part of the operation, right? That's correct. So um, as this project is grant funded, we'd like to get started um, very soon. So we're recommending that this bid be awarded. Um, we've sort of already coordinated, of course, with Twin Lakes Church. As you recall, last meeting that lease agreement was approved. Um, so we will proceed if this is awarded with acquiring the driller's permit with environmental health and um, initiating site work January 7th. Okay, Bruce. I have one question on page 392. There's the bonding information. Contractor's bond is fifteen thousand dollars, which is mouse nuts. Yeah, that's that's just to. I think that's what's submitted when they get their license. That's that's the minimum requirement for the license. It has nothing to do with the bonds we okay. require. Okay, all right, good. Yeah, they submitted they submitted a, um, a the bid bond and a and which also rolls into a maintenance bond and a performance bond that were on our forms. Okay. Okay, any other questions or comments? Any public comment on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner from Aptos. Um, I still protest cutting down all those trees. They're not diseased. <laughs> There's only one tree that looks like it's struggling, but to call them diseased when that's the healthiest stand in all of those trees along Cabrillo College Drive. Have all of you ever yet gone through? I mean, the last I time I went asked, there just the other day, but if you could, so yes. Thank you. So it bothers me a lot that these trees are gonna be cut down and just chipped up and sent to the landfill. Does that, is that included in your, your package here, the cost of, uh, hauling all of this to the landfill. And um, also I want to make a point, when I asked about this, you, your board was meeting at the Community Foundation that time, and it was taped. Um, I asked about the, the wells, the injection wells, and Director Daniels said it was all gonna be gravity feed. Mm -hmm. That's not true, because here you have, um, uh, talking about injection equipment. You're talking about um, all of these things that it's obvious it's going to be um, injection well. And I'm curious, Director Daniels, why you told the public that it was all gravity feed. There would be nothing there. It was all gravity feed and being done because that's what um, Santa Cruz City wanted it to be done for an ASR potential. So I just want to register that question and, and actually a protest that the public was misled that this was going to be gravity feed and register a protest that um, up to 19 healthy oak trees will be cut down, ground up, and hauled off to the landfill. And um, I want to know when the... Um, the bat surveys will be done because uh, they they start becoming active and and things especially if we've got a a warm season uh, unseasonally warm spit of weather thank you thank you is there anyone else okay you can respond if you want but that's what i thought it was so there are four motions for you guys to consider i make the four motions three of them actually i think just um, three um, I'll second. All in Roll favor? Call. Oh, it's a, let's see, because we have a resolution for number three. Number three. Director Lather? Yes. Director Daniels? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President LeHue? Yes. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, you know where we are. We're at written communication and correspondence. So there was just 
yeah, email okay. from Rick Longinati and a response, and lots of other written correspondence. So, any comment from the board on that? Well, 7.1 has been responded to, so that's fine. And 7.3 has been responded to, so that's fine. Okay. Anyone else? No. Okay, and members of the public on written communication. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I want to ask why um, the public correspondence regarding Pure Water SoCal was not included um, with that item. And I also want to ask why here under written communication, it's not really adequately described or fully described, written correspondence from public on item 2.52. If nobody really knew that much about this enormous project that you've just approved tonight, they would look at this and it would not be, uh, it would not pique their interest, as is stated in the Brown Act, to investigate what written comment was about. So I guess I have two um, questions about this: is why is it not included with the item that it pertains to in that area of the agenda packet, and why it's not fully described as to what the subject matter for all the written correspondence is. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, well, there is no closed session. So, can I just yes, make one, I know it's late, I just wanna point out one, there's a letter in here, I believe from in the correspondence from Mr. Doug Deaver, and I know he ran for the board a while back he, he didn't get the position, but he wrote a letter supporting your actions and the board members here. And I know he was recently elected uh, person of the year or something like that in the Aptos uh, area. And I just think it speaks well of him and the board. And I just think he deserved yeah. it a shout out for that. Yeah. All right, well, thank you all for your hard work, staff, board. We have an awesome organization. I'm pretty proud and um, have a wonderful holiday, and we'll see you January 15th. 15th? 15th. Yep. Is it? Not yeah, the 14th? The first is 14th. The Tuesday. 15th. 15th. It's the third Tuesday of January. <laughs> Let's just say first that. is on Tuesday. Okay, I got it. Okay, so 15th. All right. Yeah. Be there. Thank you. All right, thank you. Like Christmas is on a Thursday. Yeah. All right.